Happy Halloween. Welcome to this special episode. Thank you to all my guests for joining me. I'd like to give a warm welcome to Let's Read, Mortis Media, Unit 522, J Nightmares, The Darkest Hour, Vidith 22, Danny Dreadful, Dodge the Grave, Papa Scare, Booze and Booze, Derek Weber Scary Stories, Demon Creep, and Night Terrors. I hope you're ready for this. This happened about a month and a half ago. It's not a ghost story or anything, but hear me out. I heard my doorbell ring in the middle of the night. I woke up startled. Checking the time, it was around 3.30 and pitch black in my apartment. My apartment is a pretty small studio apartment. I wondered what the hell was going on, so I got up without turning on the lights, slowly approached the door and put my eye to the peephole, worried. What I saw when I looked through the peephole was a man I presumed to be in his 40s. I'm a male, I live alone, and this guy was older than me and a complete stranger. He stood there, facing my door, and he was wearing a suit. We sometimes get these people checking if we have TV licenses or doing door-to-door -door sales, but never this late. There was something wrong here. Yes? I called out. I didn't want to open the door without knowing why he was in front of my door at 3.30 a.m. I watched and he seemed to either not hear me or was in some sort of trance-like state because he didn't move or react in the slightest. I started to feel creeped out. My mind was attempting to create logic and piece together reasons for this late night visit, but it was grasping at straws. There was no good reason why he was here, let alone saying nothing. I slowly backed away from the door into the darkness of my apartment. I jumped out of my skin when I heard the doorbell ring again. I grabbed my phone and called the police from my bedroom. I told them that there was a stranger at the door and to please come quickly. I backed myself as far away as I could from my door and just listened in silence. It was quiet out there. My bell hadn't rung again since the time I called the police. About ten minutes or so and I heard a knock at the door and a voice announced that they were the police. I checked through the people and I saw two officers out there. One officer took my statement and the other was knocking on my neighbor across the hall's door. I thought to myself, why are they doing that? I must admit, I did kind of feel relieved to see someone I knew. I was still shaken up, but I think he looked more relieved than I did. My neighbor across the hall is a 20-year-old office worker like me. He said that he heard my doorbell and it woke him up. In our building, you can pretty much hear when anyone's doorbell rings. It's a pretty old building. He told the police that he heard my voice while lying in bed and he got up to see what was happening out here. When he heard my doorbell for the second time, he did what I did and approached the peephole with the lights off and saw the person who was out there. He said that he thought the man was hiding some kind of object up his coat sleeve. I dread to think what it could have been. A weapon, maybe. The strange man put his eye to my peephole several times, in what I can only assume was an attempt to look inside my apartment. My neighbor watched him do this for a while, and then suddenly the man in the hallway turned to face his door. He said it felt like he'd been spotted. He was so creeped out by that, he called the police. And I'm grateful he did. He probably helped bump this incident up their priority list. Like I said at the start, this happened a month and a half ago. My neighbor pretty much instantly moved out of our building. Unfortunately, I don't have the money to do that. I am still living here. Thankfully, nothing else has happened yet. I don't think he purposely selected me that night. I just think he was out there trying apartments to see if he could get into any. He was just a weirdo passing by. 
What really frightened me about the incident, though, was the silence. There was no attempt to persuade me to open the door, no lies to convince me. It was just cold, harsh quietness. Perhaps he was attempting to play on my curiosity or sense of decency, or maybe he just didn't want to make any noise out there where the neighbors could have heard. You can tell that I've been thinking about this a lot. I hope I never see him again. I don't want my questions answered. I believe that his intentions were sinister. I didn't know much about living in the wilderness when I bought a house with my best friend, but it was a really good deal that we just couldn't pass up. My friend Julia and I were going to school about a half an hour away, and buying a house for the next four years actually turned out to be cheaper than the rent would have been at the end of it all. Plus, this meant no landlords and we could do whatever we wanted with the place. The house was technically considered off-grid since it wasn't connected to our city's power grid, which of course helped us with the price. Thankfully, the previous owners agreed to sell us their solar panels as part of the overall price, which was actually super lucky. The house was also on septic, and we had a well, so even though it was off-grid, we still had all the luxuries of living in a house in the city. Julie and I both had pretty well-paying jobs, and I'm not ashamed to say that we both come from families who helped us with the mortgage from time to time. Anyways... The number one rule that I made with Julie when we agreed to buy this house together was that we wouldn't give our address to anyone but family. No friends, no boyfriends, and especially no random guys. We were out in the middle of nowhere, and I didn't want to risk the wrong person knowing that we, two 22-year-old women, were living 30 minutes outside of town, miles from the next house. It just didn't seem smart to me. Julie always said that she was fine with the rule, and for the first year we lived together and she respected it. At least, I think she did. Then one day, in our second year of being housemates, I came home to her making out with some random guy on the sofa in the living room. I was livid. I screamed at the guy to get out, which of course only made Julie mad, but I really didn't care. I had boundaries and my reason for not wanting men over to the house seemed pretty fair. After he left, she yelled at me that I was being stupid and having a guy over from time to time wasn't going to do anything bad. I tried telling her that it just wasn't smart letting people we don't even know into our house and letting it be known that we live alone with basically no means to protect ourselves, but she still didn't get it. She just kept saying, this isn't the movie Taken, a guy isn't going to come back and kidnap and sell us, calm down, live a little. Her making fun of the situation made me feel like I had made a huge mistake buying this house with the person I thought I knew so well. She had been my best friend for four years and I never got the impression that she would be so careless. I called my mom that night and told her what happened. She agreed with me that it was dumb of Julie to invite a guy over that she didn't even know. I also told her that it made me uncomfortable staying there knowing this guy knew where we lived, who we were, and that we lived alone. I mean, it was obvious no guy lived with us. Every picture in the place was just two of us and I'm pretty sure Julie probably told him that she only had one roommate. It wouldn't have been a shocker if she did. She brought him back to the house after all, so telling him about her life wouldn't have been a big deal. My mom told me that if I was uncomfortable that I could just stay with her for a few nights, and if I wanted to go back after, then I could, and if not, I could stay however long I needed. I appreciated the offer and decided that I'd go to school the next day, go home, pack some things, and then head off to my mom's for a bit. Julie thought that I was being dramatic, but... I didn't care. I went to school the next day as planned and made my way back to the house that afternoon. I decided to wait until Julie got home to let her know how long I'd be gone and just to make sure that she'd locked up. Clearly she wasn't the most responsible person so I couldn't rely on her to secure the place after I left. At around 8pm I decided I was done waiting and began making my way to the front door with my bag in hand. When I reached the hall that led into the living room I stopped in my tracks. Thankfully, the darkness that filled the house hid me as I watched two men in black masks standing at the door behind the frosted glass. 
They were talking to each other when I heard one of them say, I'm telling you, man, the girls who live here, oh, they're all types of fine. Now get the door open before they hear you. My heart sank and I didn't know what to do. I just had to hide. I guess now I realize that I probably should have slipped out the back door, but I really wasn't thinking. Instead, I slowly walked back into my room, shut and locked the door, and started trying to find some places to hide. I watched a movie the previous night that gave me the idea of opening my window to make it look as though I'd gone out that way, so I did that, and climbed into the back of my closet and hid under a couple of thick comforters I'd shoved back there after last winter. I heard the sound of the glass and the front door shattering, and I felt tears beginning to streak down my face. I wasn't going to be one of those girls you see in movies and TV shows who can't keep quiet, though. I was barely breathing, so I wouldn't make a sound. I listened as they made their way through the house, loudly arguing with each other that they hadn't found us yet. I silenced my phone so it wouldn't give up my hiding spot if it were to go off, and I texted Julie not to come home, that people had broken into our house and to call 911 immediately. I also texted my mom and told her what was happening and for her to call 911 too. Of course, they both started blowing on my phone, but when I heard the men try the handle to my bedroom door, I couldn't focus on anything but staying hidden and staying quiet. She's gotta be in here. Her car's out front. I'm gonna be so pissed if she's not and you had me break into this house for nothing. They argued back and forth like that for a couple of minutes until one of them must have gotten tired of it and kicked the door in. I was relieved when the window trick seemed to work and they screamed at each other that I got in the way. The relief only lasted a minute though when one of them told the other to look around for anything they could take that might have been worth something. I started praying that they wouldn't look too far into my closet, that they wouldn't pull back the comforters I was under and do what men do to women whose houses they break into. I heard one of the men leave my room but I could tell one of them stayed. I heard him begin to go through my drawers and throw things across the room. He seemed frustrated, which was probably due to the fact that I don't own super nice things. No expensive jewelry, nothing designer. I could never justify spending that kind of money and clearly this guy didn't appreciate that. My breath stopped in my throat when I heard his footsteps get closer to the closet doors. I didn't move an inch. There was no way that I was going to give this guy any reason to believe I was in there. It felt like I was going to have a heart attack when he opened the closet doors. I could feel the vibrations of him moving things around off the shelves overhead, and just when I felt him grab hold of the blankets I was under, his friend burst into the room, yelling that they had to go. Apparently they heard sirens down the road and got scared. They ran out of the house, and I stayed in my spot. I had every intention of staying there all night. I was terrified of the possibility that they were still there, and that was until I heard my mom's voice calling for me from inside the house. I tore the comforters off my body and as quickly as I could I ran toward my mom's voice. The second I saw her I burst into tears. All the emotion I'd held in that whole time was being let out and I couldn't control it. I wish I could tell you that they found the men who broke in, but they didn't. They left behind no evidence and the police didn't find anyone in the woods surrounding the house. The guy Julie brought over the previous night had a solid alibi too, so they ruled him out. He also denied telling anyone where we lived, but I don't buy it. I moved out the next day. It took a while, but Julie eventually agreed to take my name off the mortgage. One of our other friends moved in with her and I moved back in with my parents. I feel safer with them. I just wish they'd caught the guys who terrorized me that night. Lately, I've been hearing a voice outside my window, late at night. I can only make out a few words. It mutters, give it back. Then she calls out a name and asks for this person to give whatever it is back. The voice is definitely female, and it's loud enough to wake me up if I have my window open. I can usually hear this voice between 1 and 3 a.m., and between 1 and 4 times a week. Sometimes it's really loud, and other times it's as loud as the usual street noise. Unless I'm in a deep sleep, I will wake up when I hear it. 
After about two weeks, I feel sleep deprived and not my usual self. The window is close to my bed and whenever I heard the noise, I looked out there often, but I couldn't ever see anyone. I thought that I could have been hearing things. I even thought that I could have been having bad dreams. But one night, I heard something else react to the voice. There's a pretty crazy dude in my neighborhood. He lives diagonally across from my place, and I heard him shout out a few times for whoever it was to shut up. A few nights later, I was out with a good friend of mine, drinking and heading home pretty drunk. I live just off the main street and down an alleyway. To get to my place, you have to follow the curve of the alleyway, and then you come out in my little neighborhood. As soon as I came out of the alleyway, I saw a woman loitering by my house. She was holding a box under her arm. It was about the size of A5 or A4 paper. I could see papers all bundled up in there. It was her voice that I'd been hearing. She was muttering right in front of my window for someone to give something back to her. I was freaked out by her. That, coupled with being sleep deprived, created a weird cocktail of fear. She wasn't facing me and I wasn't sure if she realized I was there or not. I used this opportunity to quietly call the police. I hoped that this would be the end of me getting woken up at night so often. Two officers arrived pretty quickly and they took away the woman who went kicking and screaming. She sounded possessed. I got a little scared. I mean, I'm a single woman living alone and I didn't want this crazy person to know that I was the one who called the police. So when the officers took my statement, I said to them I wanted my details to remain anonymous and for any information they had to retain on me to be kept private. The officer called later to say that the woman was being kept in custody and for me not to worry. Now here's the scary part of this experience. It was about 2 a.m. when I got a call from the officer. About five minutes later, I heard something outside. A female voice was muttering, Give it back. Then she called out a name and asked for this person to give whatever it is back. Instantly, I was really frightened. But then I thought that I was hearing things. You know, auditory hallucinations. But when I heard the voice coming from the other side of my front door for the first time, I knew it was real. I stood there, frightened and unable to move. Then the banging started. I backed away from the door and grabbed my phone. I called the officer who had just called me and told me not to worry. I frantically told him that there was someone at the door trying to get in. He came back to search for the would-be intruder and said that he couldn't find anyone in the area. He told me to keep all my doors shut and locked and to try and calm down. I was pretty hysterical at this point. He said he would be back later to patrol the area, just in case. Then, about ten minutes after he left, I heard that dreadful voice from outside calling for someone to give something back to her. She was so much louder this time. I didn't want to call the cops again in fear that this could all be in my head. I didn't want to seem crazy. I didn't think I was. It all seemed very real to me. I didn't want to keep filling out reports all night. Confident that the doors were locked and I was safe, I got into bed and tried to ignore the shrill cries of the woman outside. In the morning, I contacted the police and asked about how long the woman would remain in custody, just in case they let her out. They said that since she really didn't settle down until 5am, and because she was being violent, she stayed in the cells that night and she'd be checked later today. So in other words, the person who came to my door definitely wasn't the person they arrested. Now that I think about it, the voices were similar but not identical. They had the same kind of raspy, stale, stilted manner and quality to their voice though. I had a meeting at work that morning I had to go to, but I was scared to leave. 
I pulled myself together and timidly headed out the front door. There were loads of dirty footprints all over the bottom half of my door. It looked as if it had been repeatedly kicked. I guess that was the banging sound. I took some photos and I headed off. When the police came in the evening, I showed them the door and my photos. Once again, when night came, I heard the voice of a woman out there calling for someone to give something back to her. The police told me that they thought there was a group of these suspicious people in the area. They weren't able to provide me with a reason or motive for their actions. That was it for me. I stayed with a friend the following night. The police were watching us that night. They patrolled both outside my home and my friend's home. They didn't find anyone that night though. After the night I stayed with my friend, the police patrols continued, but I never heard that voice again. Something weird did happen about three days later. I got a call on my home phone, and I heard a voice muttering something unintelligible. It was strange. I don't put my number in the phone book. I usually don't answer calls from withheld numbers, anonymous numbers, and that kind of thing. But my niece was staying over that night and she picked up the phone. When she answered the phone, she said that she heard nothing but silence, and that was when she handed it to me. As soon as I said hello, a voice started muttering something angrily to me. I'm kind of glad I didn't understand or hear what the voice said. I don't need to know what kind of curse or threats were attempted to be spat down the phone at me, because whenever I think about the voice I heard outside, the banging at the door, and the idea that there might be more of these cult-like people who were seemingly intent on harassing me, I get scared. I have racked my brain and I cannot think of a person, male or female, that I've fallen out with, been in a relationship with, or irritated, who could be capable of doing this. I'm glad it's all over with. I consider it all over with since I haven't had another incident for a while. If anything else happens, I will let you know. I'm a female, and back when I was 18, 19 years old, I was house-sitting with a girl I was studying with. The family we were house-sitting for went to the same church as her, but I didn't really know them that well myself. It was more to keep her company in a huge house. This was 1997, when the average teen like me did not own a cell phone. During the week that we were house-sitting, it was a short break in the school calendar, which is why this family was away and why the streets in the area were quieter than usual. My apartment, as well as the house we sat for, was not far from the university. My apartment was actually a three minute walk from it, and the house, a further five minutes by car. So being a student neighborhood, it was particularly quiet this week. The first weird thing that happened the week I was at this house was that I dreamed I was driving through a dark forest on a windy, hilly, dirt road with no lights anywhere except for those from my car's headlights. As I started to go down a hill, the headlights suddenly cut out and everything went dark. The car slowed down to a stop and died. I awoke. In the morning, I went out to my car and it wouldn't start. It had been working perfectly fine the day before, and I had to call a guy to come fix it. It was the starter motor. Well, that was the first creepy thing that happened that week. A day or two later, it was Friday. I planned on driving back home to my parents who lived in a smaller town about 45 minutes away. I packed up my stuff at the big house and was going to head over to my apartment to collect whatever else I needed for the weekend. That trip between the house and the apartment was, as I mentioned, only five minutes or so away. Since it was winter, it was dark by the time I left at seven. 
As I was driving from the house, I noticed in my rearview mirror the headlights of the car behind me tailing very close. When I turned, it turned. Back then I was cautious, but not overly so. Cautious enough to notice, in such a short distance, that something strange was going on behind me. But then, when I pulled up to a traffic light, it wasn't there anymore, and I was struck with relief. However, it was short-lived. The car was now beside me. I looked to my right, and there was a man inside, alone, smiling at me, slightly maniacally. For a moment I thought, geez, I should drive with a beanie at night so people don't think I'm a petite five foot two female with long blonde hair down to my waist, which is what I am. I also thought, well, he's in the lane to turn right, so I'm good. He pulled off and the headlights were behind me again. So close I could barely see them over the back of my car. What an ass, I thought. Who drives like that? Thank goodness my turn is coming up on the left soon. After another minute or two of this tailgating, I slowed down, strategically didn't indicate, and made a sudden sharp left into my driveway, opened the automatic gates and shot inside. The gates closed behind me, and the drama was over. I gathered a few things from the car to take up with me, and noticed on my way over to the stairwell that there was a man at the gate, just behind me. He was still on the other side, and I was at the far end of the parking lot, but I could make out it was the dude from the tailgating car. He was jumping up and down, shaking the gate with absolute rage. Well, I was safely on this side, so I wasn't completely gripped with fear. And besides, there was a group of students making a noise nearby, arriving for a party or something. I headed to the stairs and started going for the basement and ground level to the first floor rounding the stairs on the first floor, when I noticed someone running across the parking lot towards the staircase. In hindsight, I still can't fathom why I didn't put two and two together. I guess it's because I subconsciously knew that there was the group being let in through the pedestrian gate. As I was rounding the staircase between the second and third floor, someone suddenly touched me. I spun around. It was the guy. He had slipped in as part of the small crowd. He said something. I said something sassy back and told him to F off. Then I turned my back on him to continue up the stairs. I lived on the third and final floor. He grabbed me from behind, held my back against his chest with his arm around my neck, and I felt something being held against my right side. Oh crap, it was a knife. He led me down and I remember thinking that the light was broken on the bottom level, and that this couldn't end well. But I was calm. I resisted slightly, but he tightened his grip. I felt like I wasn't getting enough oxygen, and started to become a dead weight. He started to drop me. I was at groin level. I elbowed and it connected. He dropped me, but spun around to face me ripped the front of my buttons down top, and then he stopped. He looked at someone behind me, someone taller than him, and his eyes went wide. He turned around and ran. I screamed. Then I too turned around to see who had come to help, but no one was there. People came out of their apartments after that. The police were called, and this was the second time they were called there that night. Turns out other weird things have happened that my dad had already called the police about and they had come past an hour before. As it turned out, they caught the guy. I identified him in a lineup. He committed sexual assault serially and was accused of doing it to 14 women. One had thrown herself out of the first floor of her apartment to get away from him and broken her leg. Weeks later, the police called me. Before his trial, his cell door had been left open. He was gone. Apparently, it was an inside job. This happened in the early 2000s, and I was probably in first grade. This story takes place in Bulgaria. 
I am from a mid-sized town, not too small and not too big, the perfect one for raising your children. Crime is pretty much unheard of. You can sleep outside on a bench and nothing would happen to you. One weekend, some family friends from a nearby town came to my town to visit, and my parents and I decided to go to the park with them. Now, it's important to say that all of the parks in my town are located right on the edge of town, so they are actually parks and forests. At some point, the park we went to became a forest. Since it's not a very big town, we don't have central parks. In the park we went to, it runs along a river, so it's a very narrow alley, but a very long one. And on one side is the river, on the other, there is a thick forest and cliffs. At that time, I didn't like the park so much because it was a very long walk to get to the end of it. So, like most kids, I got bored of walking with my parents and the other family since they were talking grown-up stuff and I really didn't want to listen to them. I decided to run off ahead and by ahead, I mean out of sight from my parents. Keep in mind that this is a one alley park which mostly goes straight forward with slight curves due to the river. So I'd gone pretty far. Usually in this park, there are always people around and it's quite crowded on the weekends. But since it was summer, most people were on family vacations and it was surprisingly empty. I couldn't see anyone in a straight line either way. At that point, I started hearing something in the forest, which was pretty loud since on the other side was the river, and it was pretty loud by itself. I stopped and started to stare into the forest. I saw how the bushes were moving, and something was coming in my direction. I was still pretty clueless to what was happening until I saw a man with long hair, a band across his forehead dressed like a hunter with an air rifle on his back, running full speed towards me. There was no freezing moment. I just started running in the opposite direction and screaming my lungs out for my parents, hoping that they could hear me. But because of the river, I doubt that anyone could have heard me from a hundred meters away. I remember looking back and seeing him still chasing me. I thought to myself, Okay, maybe this is the end. It's over. I started to imagine how he would catch me and drag me into the forest, and how I would never see my family and friends again. It felt like an eternity, but I finally saw my parents and our family friends. My whole face was red. I was crying and snotting like crazy, barely breathing. The hunter also stopped running after he saw my parents and the others. I remember my parents started screaming at him, asking him what he thought he was doing. I was just relieved that it was over, but I remember him shaking his head like he was saying, I did nothing wrong. I was only trying to help him. The weirdest part was that there is no game in that park. It's a park after all, and the forest that he was hiding in is max 50 meters in width before the cliffs begin, so it was impossible to have any game there since there are always people walking around. You can see wild foxes, but that's about it. You need to go beyond the park out in the forest to hunt game. It's also highly illegal to carry a firearm out in public. Only police and military personnel are allowed to carry firearms. I don't know anyone who owns a gun. Civilians are only allowed to register for air guns for hunting. No hardcore weapons allowed. And of course, you're not allowed to carry them in the park where there are people. They're only permitted in regulated zones for hunting game away from populated areas. You would never see hunters like that unless you go to these zones. Or if you're in a village, which is still rare. No. We didn't report it afterwards. Too much of a hassle. This was the first and last time something like that has happened to me ever. And I haven't developed fear from that place. Even now, when I go back to my town, 
I go running in the park after midnight, and I am perfectly fine. This is one of my favorite personal stories, since everything turned out all right. But I still get chills thinking about how many different ways the night could have gone wrong. A few years ago, my friend Jane and I took a trip to Portland, Oregon. We're both from the south side of Chicago, and Jane was feeling pretty jaded with the city. She was convinced everything was better on the west coast, including the people. So, we flew out to Portland and rented a car which we named Veronica. The day before we were supposed to fly back home, we took Veronica for a drive up to Aberdeen, Washington to see Kurt Cobain's childhood home. After that, we drove down the coast, sightseeing along the way. We visited Astoria, Oregon to see the house from the Goonies and ended the day at Cannon Beach to check out Haystack Rock. All in all, it was a pretty nice day. Once it started to get dark, we decided to head back to our hotel, which is just under two hours away. I knew that I needed gas, so I told Jane to stop at the first gas station we see. Cannon Beach is a small, resort-type town. A lot of little shops and restaurants, but I didn't see any gas stations. Being from the city, I'm used to seeing two on every corner. So I wasn't really worried. I expected to find one soon. I'm completely unfamiliar with the area, so I keep following the GPS's instructions while talking to Jane. Next thing I know, we're not in any type of town. We're on a dark, winding road, surrounded by trees. At this point, I'm getting a little worried. I pull over to the side of the road to use the GPS to search for the nearest gas station. It tells me there's one about a mile down the road. Awesome. I'll get some gas and we'll be set. So I'm driving in the car. Veronica tells us that we've arrived at our destination. I pull into a completely dark and empty gas station. We're still surrounded by woods and darkness. As far as I can tell, there's nothing around for miles. According to Veronica, we have about 10 miles worth of gas in the nearest gas station is 30 miles away. Jane and I are sitting there, trying to figure out what to do, when another car pulls in. I keep going on about my business. I don't really pay attention to the other car. I just assume that they need gas too. Out of the corner of my eye, I see someone gesturing to me. After some hesitation, I crack the window to see what they want. There's a middle-aged man and his wife in the car. He starts asking us all kinds of questions. Need to fill up? Coming from the beach? Driving back to Portland? I keep my answers polite but short. Then, he tells us that he actually owns the gas station we're at, but doesn't make enough money to keep it open that late. He tells us that he knows of a Chevron about three miles away, and gives us directions for it. He gave us his number and says to give him a call in case we don't make it to Chevron. My name is Sam the Mechanic. Let me know if you don't make it and I'll come rescue you ladies. We thank him profusely and head out. Jane's going on and on about how nice that was and how that would have never happened in Chicago. I agreed. That was very nice, if odd, of him. Strange that he happened to be driving past his gas station at the same time we pulled in, but whatever. I make a joke about him calling his buddy at the gas station saying, I'm sending two women your way. We make it to the Chevron, and this kid, 18 or 19 years old, comes out to pump our gas. He asks us how we're doing and then says, There's a lot of weirdos out tonight. Jane and I look at each other, I let out a small laugh and say, Told you. I turn back to the kid and I ask him what he means. He tells me this story about how his brother owes some drug dealer a ton of money and now he's hiding somewhere nearby 
He's planning on kicking the shit out of him once he gets off his shift. I can tell Jane is getting uncomfortable with the building and the weirdness of the night. So, I give the kid a good tip, wish him luck, and start driving again. At one point during our conversation, Jane calls Sam the mechanic and leaves him a voicemail. She tells him that we made it to the gas station and how much we appreciate his help. I thought the call was unnecessary, but it is what it is. A few minutes later, we're on the highway, and we're about ten minutes from the hotel. Jane's phone rings, and it's Sam. Again, she thanks him profusely. He asks her where we're from and when we're flying home. He tells her his name is Sam Glusty, and he wrote a book called Wrongfully Accused. We should read it when we're on a plane ride home. This piqued my interest. Jane, you have to look up that book to see what it's about. She Googles it. Then she goes limp, and she looks like she's going to puke. What is it? I ask. He was accused of being the Green River Killer. Immediately, she starts freaking out. He has my number now. Back at the hotel, we do some more digging. Apparently, a victim of the Green River serial killer picked Sam out of a lineup. However, the real killer was caught and convicted based on DNA evidence. But around the same time in the 70s, Sam was convicted and served time for abducting and assaulting a young woman in the area that we were in. The book he wrote was about all of that. We ended up stuck in Portland for two more days due to a snowstorm in Chicago. It was a weird, tension-filled two days, considering the circumstances and weirdness of that night. Things could have gone horribly wrong. I'm glad all I got out of that night was a story. A few summers back, after I had just turned 18, a friend had invited me and some other friends to their family's second home in wine country. I was super excited, and I'd agreed to meet my friends at a semi-distant subway station, BART, Bay Area Rapid Transit. Since it was only a weekend trip, I had all of my stuff in a backpack and my sleeping bag hooked on to the backpack. I'm pretty sure that because of that, many people mistook me for a female vagrant and thus more approachable, or maybe vulnerable. Indeed, that subway trip alone had more weird encounters than I've ever had before. That same trip, I got hit on by a man three times my age and screamed at by a homeless man who was asking for the time. However, By far the weirdest encounter that day, and probably in my life, was when the bearded woman in the open back hospital gown and hospital bracelet approached me. Now, I don't like to think of myself as discriminatory towards people with mental health issues, as most of my friends are depressed in some form or fashion. Yet, when that woman in a hospital gown and plastic hospital bracelet When she approached me, my mind went straight to all those horror films about people escaping from an insane asylum, which turned out to not be too far from the truth. To give a bit more details on this woman, she was physically intimidating due to her very large and wide stature. She was at least six inches taller than me and weighed a good 70 pounds more. And most memorable of all, She had a large amount of sparse, patchy, and wiry facial hair. When she started to approach me, I desperately looked down at my phone and tried to pretend I was anywhere else but on that train platform, hoping that she wasn't actually headed for me. That, of course, did nothing, and she sat right next to me. She first asked if she could borrow my phone, I really didn't want this person to borrow my phone. 
as not only did I need to save the battery to rendezvous with my friends, but there'd recently been a string of cell phone thefts on BART. I was not about to let mine get stolen, so I gave her some excuse about my battery, hoping that she would just leave me alone. Unfortunately, my refusal was not a deterrent, as she took that as a cue to strike up a conversation. She asked if I was traveling, picking up on my large backpack and sleeping bag, and I said yes, but trying to be as vague as possible. Then, she asks where I'm going, and as I did not know how to deflect her, and being too deeply uncomfortable to lie, I said the truth. Napa. She then proceeds to tell me how she'd gotten locked up at a psychiatric facility in Napa, after she had beat her husband with a phone receiver, after he threatened her. Feeling very glad that I had not given her my phone, I tried to defuse the situation by sympathizing with her over her awful ex-husband. That prolongs the conversation, and she asks me again to borrow my phone, so that she could show me a website called World's Best Gore Vids. Apparently, there's a particular video she was a fan of. It was a graphic video of a man getting his head run over by a tank. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not something I want to watch, ever. But especially not with the woman who had just admitted to savagely beating someone. Luckily, soon after, my train arrives at the station, and I board it. Unluckily, so did she. She kept talking to me during the ride. For my part, I tried to say as little as possible, to not seem rude and anger her, while also trying to make it clear that I wasn't interested in talking. She didn't pick up on this cue, or didn't care. We parted ways a few stops later when she got off the train. She told me that she was meeting her new boyfriend there, and she'd wanted to call him, which is why she wanted to borrow my phone. I sincerely hope that her new man does not have any phone receivers lying around. This happened when I was 11. I have an older brother who was 16 at the time, and two younger brothers. My parents would often go out for dinner on a Friday, and leave us home with some hired videos, pizza, and my brother in charge. My brother would often leave to his friend's place down the road, on the same street, and then leave me in charge. I liked this because I liked being in charge, and I got to choose the movies. This Friday night it was stormy and raining on and off. There was some lightning and thunder around. I was watching a movie and my two brothers were playing in the carport. It was a large open plan space you can fit four cars under and because my mom and dad were out you could skateboard, ride a bike and do all sorts of things. Standing in our carport to the left was a park. We had no neighbors on this side, so you'd often see people using the footpath walking their dogs, riding, running into the night, as there were some half-decent street lamps dotting along it. If you went out of our driveway, you could go straight into the park. It was a great place to grow up. This night, my brother was on the road as usual, and had written his friend's number down and left us to it. I was probably into our second movie for the night when my two younger brothers ran in and said a man is watching them from the park near our fence. Now, normally I'd think they were playing a joke, but their faces had that different, concerned look, so I thought I'd better come and have a look. We head back out to the carport, standing in the doorway looking out toward the park. There's no sign of him. There's a lightning flash and it lights up enough just outside of the carport that we see the man my brother saw is now standing in our yard watching us. We all screamed and slammed the door, 
We ran to my mom and dad's room and locked the door. We grabbed the phone and ran the cord from the bedroom to the bathroom and we locked the door. We called my brother's friend's house. His friend answers and I tell him there's a man in our yard. He yells out to my brother and then says they're coming up on their BMX bikes. The wait was probably not even five minutes till they arrived, but it felt like ages. When they left, my brother told his friend's parents and they called the police and they came up as well. We came back out of the house when they arrived, calling out to us. When they arrived, they said the man was gone. Soon after, the police arrived, and then another vehicle that went up through the park. It was sort of a scary night, but the police searched our house for us, and the yard, and the streets, and the park. It seemed pretty reassuring at the time. And to me, my big brother was fearless, and always looked out for us. Having him back, was just as reassuring as having the police being there. My parents arrived home not too long after, with two police cars at our house and the neighbors in the driveway. My brother's friend's parents were there as well. This was not during the time of mobile phones, so I'm thinking what they were wondering had happened as they came into our driveway probably had their hearts racing. I don't recall hearing that the man was ever found or caught. Years later, when I moved out and my younger brothers took over my room, my dad told me one night, my younger brother woke my mom and dad, white as a ghost, was their words, and he said a man was standing at his window. The man woke him up saying, hey boy, are your parents home? My parents never told any of us that at the time. But the timeline fit with them changing the big open window fly screen with metal anti break in bars. There's a long and established family run restaurant in my hometown. I don't want to mention the name for fear of legal repercussions. My hometown is way out in the countryside. There aren't many businesses there. Everyone sort of knows everyone, especially the family who runs the restaurant. Their business has been around for generations. I don't have any friends in this town and I'm okay with that. The restaurant family has an eldest son that I sometimes spoke to, but he was a few years older than me. He went to university and I didn't see him for a while. About seven to eight years ago, that man damn near lost his mind. And seven to eight years ago was about the last time I saw him. Let me tell you what happened. It was late, but not that late. I was playing on my NES. Then from nowhere, I heard this kind of moaning voice. Let me try and contextualize it for you. It sounded like a kid who was nagging their parent for a toy in a store. Something like a whine, but not one of pain. At first I thought it could even be the sound of a distant howling dog, but I quickly realized that it was human. It was really creepy since it was dark out, and there was nothing but open fields outside my window. I didn't like it at all, so I ran downstairs to tell my mum about what I heard. She opened our back garden doors and listened intently. She paced back and forth, restlessly trying to place the sound. I remember being nervous. It ended up not bothering my mum as much as it bothered me. I think she said, ah, don't worry, it's just the sound of the outdoors, or something like that. So I went back upstairs to continue playing my game. But that moaning didn't cease. I hated it. It made my skin crawl, yet I was curious somehow. I moved over to my window and looked outside in search of the source of that sound. I determined that the moaning was coming from the restaurant. Not the restaurant itself, but the building behind it. The building I assumed they stored their produce in. From my window, I could see a skylight over the building. I saw something moving around in there. 
Since it was dark, I couldn't see what was in the room beneath the skylight, but I could clearly see something that looked like it was human. And that human was making that sound. It was holding onto the window frame and shaking it as hard as they could whilst making that dreadful sound. I remember thinking it was like a human in a zoo. It was clearly trapped. I ran over and got my mother and told her to come and look. She said that she knew who that was. It was the eldest son from that restaurant family. I asked her for more details because I couldn't make sense of what I was seeing. My mother told me that from what she heard around the town, his mother pressured him into university. A prestigious university, no less. The pressures of achieving his parents' expectations were too much for him to bear, since they demanded nothing short of top grades. There was a rumor around town that he had a nervous breakdown, and no one had seen him since. So, it has been said that he was given a room in that warehouse. Well, perhaps a more accurate term might be confined to a room in that warehouse. The fact that their son has suffered with his mental health has embarrassed his parents, and apparently he is being hidden away to spare their blushes. Of course, these were nothing but rumors, but when I heard that moaning coming from the direction of that warehouse, I couldn't help but think that these were truthful rumors. All the while my mother was explaining this, he was rattling and wailing. He reminded me of my friend's hamster, the way it knew where the opening to the cage was, but lacked the capacity to escape it. I said to my mother, let's go over there. It's not right what they're doing to him. My mother wanted nothing to do with it. I'm a female and I was a teenager at the time and I didn't want to do it alone. So I told my mother that I would call the police and have them deal with it. I was told not to cause an uproar and just to ignore it. Deep down, I couldn't ignore it. I couldn't listen to that poor man go on moaning like that. I knew that no one else would do anything about it either, since the only house close enough to be in earshot of the warehouse was ours. I guess that's why my mum didn't want us to be the ones who complained. I mean, if that family did that to their own son, what would they be capable of doing to their neighbours? In a sense, I was the only one who could hear him, and I didn't want to let him down. I had to find the courage to go to his family home and speak to them myself. I told my mother what I intended to do, and she didn't try to stop me. She didn't try to come with me either. I got to their house, and I rang their door buzzer again and again. They had an intercom, so I knew they heard me. In fact, anything I said was audible through the intercom. Realizing this, I began to speak to them. Excuse me, there's someone in your warehouse. I think someone might be hurt in there. There was no response. I was shaking with adrenaline and fear. I took the plunge and shouted, Fine, I'll just call the police. As soon as I said that, I got a reply. There's no one in there. Please go away, the voice said. I couldn't do much else than go home and call the police. Seconds after I left, the wails of their son stopped abruptly and I never heard them again. Could the rumors just be rumors? Could an animal have gotten in there? I don't know. I didn't know what to do. I never heard him again, and eventually, time passed and I left home. He will be 30 years old this year, according to my mother, if he's still alive. Is he still out there, in that big dark warehouse? I ask my mum as often as I can if she's heard any noises coming from the warehouse, but she says she hasn't. This really plays on my mind. When I was in kindergarten, I was forced to swallow a thumbtack. I want to share my experience on the off chance that it might help someone out there. It's a long shot, but I figured, why not? When I was a kid, I went to a kindergarten in a school called the Sakura Group. My teacher had one simple rule, and that was, 
you cannot tell a lie. There was even a weird song about it that the teacher made us sing in the morning at school. I can't remember the words, perhaps because I wish to forget them, but to my recollection it went something like this. If you tell a lie, you have to swallow a thousand needles. We sang that song all the time. I never liked it. The meaning inferred was that if you break a promise or a lie, then you will be hurt just as much as the person you lied to will be hurt. It was a very old rhyme from the 1800s. When I was in kindergarten, I didn't really understand the meaning of the song. You know, kind of like Red Riding Hood, you never feel bad for the grandma, it just happens. Sometimes in class, we watched a kid's TV show called Mr. Nopo. I haven't seen it since kindergarten. Anyway, the episode we watched was about him making animals out of old milk cartons. We were allowed to do the same thing the next day in class, and I was really excited. So our teacher said, All right, everyone, please bring in your milk carton tomorrow so we can make our animals. Don't forget to ask your parents when you get home. Don't forget, it's got to be a milk carton. Everyone in the class, including myself, responded with, Yes, miss. I got home as fast as I could, and I asked my parents for a milk carton. My mum told me that we had only just opened the milk in our refrigerator, so I couldn't use that one. She then produced an empty soy milk carton from the garbage. She said it was the same kind of thing. The next day, I proudly brought my soy milk carton to kindergarten, but I was told that my milk carton wasn't right. When you think about it, the cartons are slightly different in perhaps the paper color or the thickness. Mr. Nopal from that TV show didn't tell us on TV how to make an animal out of a soy milk carton. He told us to use a milk carton. I guess that's why the kindergarten teacher got so angry with me that day. Hey, this isn't a milk carton. Everyone in the classroom, including you, promised to bring in a milk carton to class today, right? Why, why, why have you brought something entirely different? She scolded. I was too young, too shy, and too nervous to respond. I just sat there shocked. She turned to her desk at the head of the class, rooted around in her desk drawer, and then stormed towards my desk with something in her hand. Turned out to be a thumbtack case. She stopped at my desk with a half smile and turned to the other children in my class and proudly declared, Everyone, your fellow student has told a lie today. He promised to bring a milk carton, but he has brought something entirely different to class. So what do we do when somebody lies? Can anybody remember? That's right. They have to swallow a thousand needles, don't they? I was so dumbstruck that I remained silent. I was half expecting it to be a big joke, but I could see by the look in my teacher's eyes that it was far from funny to her. It was unthinkable, yet happening. I couldn't say a word. She approached me and opened the case of pins and said, You broke a promise. Get ready to swallow them. I couldn't. I, I couldn't. Look, everyone, he can't even commit to accepting his punishment, and the poor boy can't do it. When you think about it, a thousand is too many, isn't it? Okay. That's okay. Don't worry. I'll change the rules. Just this one time. Not a thousand, but a hundred. Off you go. She hadn't forgiven me. She approached me with the pin in her hand. She held my nose and made me open my mouth. I thought I could escape her punishment if I pretended to swallow it, but it didn't work. I held the thumbtack between my back teeth and made a swallowing gesture. She looked at me and then slapped me in the face. The force of her slap caused me to spit out the thumbtack and it tumbled down onto my desk. The classroom was so silent it was as if you could hear a pin drop she snatched up the pin and jabbed it at my nose not even one you can't even manage one if you lie this is your medicine the other option is death everyone knows this i'm trying to teach you the importance of not telling lies she got so angry she dropped the thumbtacks all over the floor i was made to find the thumbtack i had in my mouth i remember crying and the sound of my sobbing being the only sound in that classroom. The fun I assumed we would have that day creating animals out of milk cartons was destroyed. 
Everyone was looking at me with cold eyes, like I had caused all of this. And I was young enough to believe that it was my fault. The kindergarten teacher couldn't determine which thumbtack I had in my mouth, so she threw them all away. That was what saved me that day, I guess. I'm so glad I spat it out. I don't know if anyone else told on her. I never spoke about this until now. This happened many, many years ago. The laws and changes in school have been abundant since I was a kid. But the memories still stir up trauma in me. This happened over a decade ago, and is about the only really creepy encounter I've had in my life. I'm a single mother, and live in a fairly large city in the Midwest. It was just me and my toddler. It was winter when this happened. There was a pretty fierce snowstorm blowing outside. I'm a smoker, so I still have to go outside and deal with the wind, pelting my face with snow as I feed my final craving of the night before heading to bed. My porch is covered and has trees in front of it, so it was really hard to see in the night. I never turn my porch light on when I go out to smoke. It was late, about 11 or 12 at night. The street was deserted. Although I live in a big city, my neighborhood is really quiet at night. My street dead ends to a park, so there isn't much traffic. As soon as I stepped outside, I could hear something in the distance. I spark up my cigarette anyway, and look down the street to where the noise was coming from. It sounded sort of like an animal growling. As the noise got closer, but was still about a block away, I could see a man walking. He was all in black, hood up, and I couldn't make out anything beyond this. He was speaking in a deep, guttural growl. It was the most demonic thing I've ever heard. It honestly did not sound human. But I know crazy can make people inhuman. It's hard for me to describe just how fear-invoking this voice was. But I also have a curious nature. So I stood out in the storm like a deer in headlights, watching and listening. I can't really remember most of what he said, but I do remember the phrase... This is the Book of the Dead. He was walking on the opposite side of the road as my house, and had made it about a half a block away. I hadn't moved from directly in front of my door, holding my cell phone with a death grip in my pocket, and I'm also smoking a cigarette as quickly as possible to get back inside. He was approaching the intersection right before my dead-end street. I figured he would turn. I hoped he would turn. He didn't. He kept walking toward the dead end, still speaking in this deranged voice, incoherently, something about this book of the dead. At this point, there are a million things racing through my mind. He can't see me. He's just some random crazy. Even though he was just about right across from my house, I still couldn't make out any details of his face, or really see anything beyond the black hood. Suddenly, he stops talking, stops walking, and his hood slowly turns in my direction. I drop my cigarette, rush into my house and lock the door, looking out of the window to see what he does. He just stood there for probably 30 seconds, and then started walking again. He crossed the street and stopped again, directly in front of the sidewalk from my door to the street. He stood facing my house for three to four minutes. I stood behind my locked door, staring at him as he stared back at me. Although he was only about 20 feet from me, his hood still concealed his face. I was debating internally if I should call the cops. My phone still clutched in my hand but he honestly wasn't breaking the law in any way. He was just standing on the sidewalk, looking at my house. The standoff felt like it lasted an hour, 
with my heart leaping out of my chest. He was silent as he stood, and the only thing I could hear was the wind and pellets of snow tapping on my windows. He turned and started walking again, speaking again in his growl. He kept on walking down the dead end and then in to the park. I could faintly hear his demonic voice through the door as he walked, and that was it. He was gone. I checked on my son, and he was sleeping soundly, although I can't say I did the same that night. Whenever I sleep outside of my bedroom, like at a hotel or something, I hear this strange sound. It sounds like someone sighing or exhaling. It's somewhere in the room, but I can never find out where it's coming from. It sounds like there's someone else sleeping in the room with me. Even with all the lights on, I still can't find the source of the sound. It's very strange. I've tried taking photos and videos with my phone, but when I play them back, I get nothing. I turn all the lights off and I squint as I wait for my eyes to become adjusted. And sometimes I feel like there's something in the darkness. I can't be sure though. It's like I can sense there is something in the room with me, some shape in the dark. I get worried whenever I hear that sound and it's become impossible to ignore. I first noticed it last September, and once I heard it, there was no way to unhear it. I travel a lot for work, and my company has this wonderful ability to put me in the cheapest, most out-of-the-way hotels that money can buy. I guess maybe sleeping in all these rundown places might have created some kind of apprehension, and maybe I'm just imagining things. Well, that's what I thought, up until very recently. I heard the same sound at my house. The one place I had never heard it before. It happened when I came home late from work. I remember that I had brought pasta home with me that night and was eating it in my kitchen while my family was asleep. My eyes were very dry, so I reached for the eye drops to put one in each eye. I then heard that strange sighing sound. I wanted to open my eyes, but since I had just put the drops in them, I couldn't open them right away. So I slowly opened my right eye, only a little bit, and I looked around the kitchen. But of course, there was nothing there. This was new. Like I said, I had only ever heard the sound when I was away from my house. But that night, I heard it inside my own home. I was annoyed now, and I wanted some answers. I wasn't in a hotel. I was at my own house. So I could investigate as much as I felt like it. So that's what I did. I looked around the kitchen, but the sound wasn't coming from there. Maybe it was coming from down the hall. No, maybe it's coming from the back door. Nothing there. I was really straining my ears while I was searching. I felt like the sound was definitely coming from inside the kitchen. So I left the room and walked back in to reset. Or get fresh ears? Is that even a phrase? I don't know. As soon as I re-entered the kitchen, I heard it. It sounded like it was coming from somewhere close to the refrigerator. The thought that it could be some kind of mechanical noise, and I've had one too many late nights, did cross my mind. Until I heard the exhaling sound mixed in with the dull hum of the refrigerator. It's here. I know it's around here somewhere. I thought, as I bent over searching. The sound was louder for the first time. It felt like I was getting closer, and with that in mind... I decided to hit the lights to see if it made a difference. Usually I do need some time to allow my eyes to adjust and that's when I feel like I can almost see something. But this night was a little different. 
from my left eye, I could see very clearly in the dark. I guess it was because I kept my left eye shut when I was initially searching around the kitchen. This was getting interesting. After several moments, I see two white dots emerge out of the darkness. I quickly realized that these dots were the whites of someone's eyes. I could see that the irises of these eyes were dark, perhaps black, and they were looking directly at me. I gasped in shock. I had never seen anything like that before. I kept looking, and I couldn't stop to my surprise. I then saw a figure of someone, the owner of these eyes. It looked as if they were tied up. Their limbs were clearly bound. Their mouth wasn't visible. At that moment I realized that the sound that I had been hearing was someone breathing through their nose. I could sense that there was no panic in this person. There was just an aura of hopeless acceptance. They were not fighting against their situation. The atmosphere in the darkness of my kitchen was that of pure desolation and surrender. The steady, patient breathing continued. I watched in stunned horror. I could not move. After a few moments, the figure of the bound person appeared to become blurry and then faded into the darkness. To this day, I still have no idea who this person was, or perhaps I should say, apparition. I haven't heard the breathing again in my house. I really wish I knew more about this poor soul, and I wonder if I will ever hear it again. Next week, I will be going on another business trip, and I will do the same things that I did last time in an attempt to see the bound person again. I will use my eye drops and become accustomed to the dark. Perhaps I will see them again. I'm not sure. I am both excited and terrified. The user who shared this story never made another comment on this post. This story goes back to the year 2015. It was around 8 p.m. and it was summer, so at that time it was just getting dark. I live in a town where a crime almost never happens. It's a very safe rural area with few people. Here all the shops close early, so that night I went shopping around 7.40 and everything was quiet. I didn't have enough money to pay. So I bought some stuff, and when I got home, I had to go out again to take the rest of the money I needed to pay to the store. I was listening to music. I had bought new headphones and was trying them out. I was walking two blocks from my house when a motorcycle with two men came out of nowhere. The man on the back got off and took out a gun, pointed it at my head, and started yelling at me to give him my cell phone. He yelled, Give me everything. Give me everything. And I just squeezed my cell phone and headphones and yelled, No, no, these are my things. Over and over again. And the whole time, the gun was pointed at my face less than a meter away. When the guy with the gun saw I wouldn't give him anything, he fired. I saw very clearly how he pulled the trigger on the gun. He got on the motorcycle with the other man, and they left at full speed. I didn't get shot at. I don't know if it was a real gun or fake, if it had bullets in it or not. I don't know anything. Plus, it was just after dark, but it was the most terrifying experience I've ever had. As soon as they left, I ran out and got to the store where I was going first. I arrived crying and shaking. It was hard for me to speak. I asked for help and they called my mom who came to pick me up in a taxi because I didn't want to walk home even though it was four streets away. That was the first and last time I experienced a robbery attempt. 
It was the most damn stressful situation I've ever been through. I don't know how to describe the absolute panic I felt when I saw the barrel of a gun in front of my eyes, and all for a cheap fucking cell phone and some headphones. God, they didn't give a shit about a girl's life. They put a fucking gun to my face. I wish that no one has to go through this, much less children. I was lucky, but many are not. Especially in the city to which my town belongs, where this is a common occurrence. I've had a few scary encounters in my life. I'm not sure if that means that I'm old or just a creep magnet, but this one still creeps me out. In the early 80s when I was 8, my family was visiting my uncle who lived in Backwoods, Missouri. He lived on a lot of land and the only other people who really even lived on the street were relatives, so no one else ever just happened to be out there. This meant no one ever locked their doors because random family members were always coming by for this or that. One night, while we were there, my parents and aunt and uncle decided to go to a nearby town to go bowling, because bowling. My brothers, who were 11 and 12, my female cousins, 6 and 14, and I, I'm female, stayed home. It was still daylight when the adults left, but it started raining pretty hard and got dark quickly. We used to play this game that was essentially hide and seek in the dark house, but we cleverly called it Vampire. There was a thin little mattress on the living room floor that some of the kids would sleep on at night, so the person who was it would lie on the mattress and fold it over themselves, like a coffin, and count down to midnight. When they got to midnight, they went looking for you. Again, all of the lights are off and you tried to make it back to the coffin before you got caught. Because the house was in the country, it was pitch black at night. You couldn't see your hand in front of your face. What this meant for the game was that, one, you couldn't tell where the vampire was looking, so you just had to make a break for it. And two, if you were extremely lazy and I'm sure by now you can guess which of us met those standards, you could hide in the living room with a coffin and get the base quickly. Ben, my 11 year old brother, was it and was doing the normal countdown. I was hiding maybe six feet from him. As he was counting, there was a flash of lightning. I don't know if I was already looking at the living room window or if the lightning made me look, but with the backlight of the lightning, I saw a man with his face against the window. He had his hands on each side of his face, as if he was trying to peer in, and he looked exactly like the stereotypical creepster. Heavy set, scraggly beard, etc. I could feel every hair on my body standing on end. Immediately I began to convince myself that I didn't see what I saw. But then, Ben sternly whispered, If anyone is hiding in here, stay still. I sort of croaked out and... I'm here, right as there was another flash of lightning. The creepster was still there but was no longer trying to look in the window. Instead, he was now looking toward the front door. Ben and I immediately knew what was coming next. From where he was standing, creepster was probably only five feet from the front door. Ben was the same distance, but there was a couch between him and the door. Ben leapt over the couch and locked the door, right as the man started trying the handle. At this point, I guess Ben decided that it was best to let the man know that people were home and that we knew he was there, because he flipped on the porch light and then started turning on the lights in the house. This is going to sound weird, but I was too terrified to panic. Having said that, I was relying completely on Ben to know and tell me what to do. He told me to go lock the other doors and was yelling for everyone else to come out and lock all of the windows. As I was locking the side door, 
we saw the guy moving around to the back of the house. So Ben told me to hurry and lock the sliding glass door. Those doors are right around the corner from each other, so I was closest. As soon as I flipped the lock on the back door, the guy was standing there, just looking in at me. I just stood there for a couple of beats, frozen, looking at him. I clearly recall hearing Ben in a very calm but firm voice say, Close the curtain. Listen to me, okay? Close the curtain. So, I did. We tried to call the police, but my aunt and uncle had a stupid party line, and it wouldn't work. Whether from the storm or from a neighbor leaving it off the hook or whatever. For the record, they're the only people I've ever known with a party line, so this wasn't normal to me either. But for those of you who don't know what that is, in really rural areas, multiple people on the street would actually share a phone line. It would have different rings for different households, but you could pick up the phone and listen to your neighbor's conversation. We also tried to summon help on my uncle's CB radio, but couldn't reach anyone. My uncle was a hunter, so he had a gun rack full of rifles in his room, but my older cousin was on an out-of-town hunting trip and took them with him. All we could find was a BB gun that looked like a real rifle. I vividly remember Ben putting me on phone duty and Scott, my older brother, on CB duty. While he stood watch at the little square window on the front door with the BB gun. Maybe 30 minutes later, Ben said, he's back. He's coming up the driveway. The rest of us froze in fear. But Ben opened the door and stepped out on the porch, pointed the gun and said, get out of here right now. Then we hear our cousin Kyle, who lived down the road a bit, say, you know that's a BB gun, right? Even though Kyle was only 15, I remember that we felt like we had been saved when he showed up. Kyle seemed really skeptical of our story, like we were playing a trick on him, even though we had no idea he was coming. But he stayed with us until our parents came home. We saw the man in the front yard once more. There was a long gravel driveway, off to one side of the driveway, quite away from the house was a spot where my cousins parked cars they were working on. I know, so stereotypical. While we were on watch, we saw the guy messing with one of the cars. It was actually Kyle's. When he couldn't get it started, he walked into the woods and ran beside the house. We didn't see him again after that. Honestly, I don't remember if we even told our parents what happened when they got home. There was definitely no police involvement though. We just went on with our trip. But we never played vampire again. Without some mention of that night. I honestly forgot about this evening. It wasn't until my cousin brought it up to me one night when we were actually talking about Reddit and the creepy and crazy things that I'd experienced growing up. I'm 25 and this must have happened when I was 10 or 12. My cousin came to visit me during the summer. I live in a small town and at the time there probably wasn't even 2,000 people living here. I may not know everyone but I do know quite a few people in my subdivision, enough to know that most of them are elderly or parents with kids, so this made what happened so strange. I was just looking for my cat. She's allowed to go out, which has never been a problem, other than one time when she ran away for a whole week, and ever since then she's had a curfew, 9pm just before dusk. In my backyard, there's a football field and in the bush, just more of a reason to have her inside at night. It was getting late and she still hadn't come in. Of course at the time, me, not really paying attention, because I was visiting with my cousin. Before I knew it, it was passing midnight and we were heading to bed. 
I noticed I hadn't seen my cat and started to freak out. I had looked everywhere in the house and had shaken her treats and nothing. I decided to try looking around the house outside and still I couldn't find her. I went inside to tell my cousin I was going to walk up the street and see that maybe she was in someone's yard. I live on one of the end streets of the subdivision so there's a curve at the beginning of my street and as I made my way up the street I was calling my cat's name out and checking the yards as I went along. It was past midnight now so I didn't expect anyone to be out but then there was this man. He was just standing at the end of the street, the second street after mine. He was just standing there, back facing me on the other side of where the street light is. I couldn't really see much of him. I didn't think too much of it because I was preoccupied looking for my cat, but then I noticed he turned around and faced right. I mean he completely turned his body to the right and then straight ahead and then to the left. As I was seeing this, I was kind of confused, thinking, what is this man doing? Is he looking for something? And then he turned and faced my direction, and he started walking, which again didn't startle me, until I realized that he noticed me and started running. This full-grown man started full-out running toward me. I was so scared. I ran as fast as I could and I could hear his footsteps getting louder and closer. I was only four houses away from my house so it didn't take me long to get there. As soon as I got in, I slammed my door and locked it. And just as I did, staring out the door window, heart racing, I didn't see anyone out there. Relieved I didn't, but sort of curious and confused, wondering where this man could have gone. I went to the living room to look out the big window that oversees the whole street, and nothing. No one. To boot, my cat was inside when I came in. I have no idea how, who, or where this man came from or went, but I was just looking for my cat. It was terrifying. This happened to me and the man I was dating back in the late spring of 2000. I am an avid and experienced urban explorer. I have visited many different abandoned sites. The place I'm writing about has been explored several times by others since, but when I visited, it wasn't a commonly known location and all the buildings were still intact, except for the main house which had, from what I had heard, burned, leaving nothing but the outer stone wall. Nothing but the outer wall remains, and all of the other buildings have been torn down since I was there. To more recent urban explorers, it is known as the Stone Castle, and even more recently, the Ostler Castle, the name given by the Heritage Society that has decided to fix it up. When my boyfriend at the time discovered it, he saw it in the distance from a roof he was working on in Oro, Medante, Ontario. There was once, but not anymore, a large barn, a carriage house, and towards the back of the property, a stable. The first weekend we both had off together, we made the hour drive to explore it. The property was absolutely stunning. On the top of a hill back from the road, you can almost imagine living surrounded by such beauty. And we did exactly that. The house itself was gone except for the wall. And if you looked in the basement window, you can see an old stove laying amongst the wreckage. You could tell it had been a beautiful home at one time, to whomever owned it. Being the explorer I was, I insisted that we investigate every single corner of every single building that was on the property, and although my ex was less than enthusiastic about it, I insisted. I honestly did not see the point of driving for an hour just to look at the outside of the buildings. No. I had to go in the buildings. The first building we explored was the barn, both upstairs and down. Down in the basement of the barn is where things went from wow to holy shit really fast. 
The basement had been used as a place for satanic sacrifices. There was satanic artwork all over, a knife with what appeared to be blood on it, and an altar with black candles, a bottle of what smelled like blood. The most disturbing thing was that whatever satanic group was using it, they had built a makeshift cage out of the silo, with chains inside and everything. My boyfriend at the time wanted to get the heck out of there as fast as possible, but I convinced him to stay so we could explore the rest of the buildings on the property. I told him it was probably just a bunch of kids just screwing around. No big deal, right? Wrong. Our next stop was the stables at the back of the property, and honestly, I was so caught up in my love for exploring that he would not have been able to persuade me to leave without going in every single building, no matter what. I opened the door into the stables and the smell hit me. Rotting flesh. The entire room was littered with animal corpses, dogs, cats, rabbits, even coyotes and foxes. They had been horribly mutilated. It was absolutely the worst thing I have ever laid my eyes upon. As soon as my boyfriend saw that, he grabbed me and said that we were leaving right at that moment and that killing animals is not stupid kids doing stupid things. This is some serious shit. So, we started to leave, but there was one more building I wanted to check on the way out. The carriage house. He said no effing way were we going in there and stomped off up the hill back to the main house, assuming I would follow. I didn't follow. I went around the hill by myself and took a quick peek in the carriage house. It was anticlimactic. It had absolutely nothing in it. It's actually a good thing that I snuck off like I did, because if I hadn't, we wouldn't have seen them coming. They would have been able to sneak up on us as we were coming up the hill and do God knows what to us. The first one I noticed was an adult male with a baseball bat. He had actually opened our car door and was rifling through our things in our car, trying to find a key, I'm guessing. There were about eight people in total in the group, ranging from adults, I would say in their 30s, to teenagers and children no more than 12 or 13. They all had weapons, golf clubs, sticks, a cane, and baseball bats. I yelled at the guy what the hell he thought he was doing going through our car, and my boyfriend came charging over the hill. Bless his heart. Right through the posse of creeps and weirdos who seemed to be lying in wait for us. It appeared that we had ruined whatever plans they had in mind because they immediately backed off, some even trying to hide their weapons behind their backs, which was just stupid if you ask me. Who wouldn't notice a baseball bat behind somebody's back? Baseball bat guy demanded to know what we were doing there, and I demanded to know what the hell he thought he was doing in our car. He didn't answer. He just looked at me all nervous. My ex-boyfriend said we were just admiring the architecture of the house and that we were just leaving, and they let us get into our car and drive off. Which, in itself, was a miracle, I'd say, in light of what we had discovered on the property. They followed us in a black pickup, with no plates for a good 20 minutes. Instead of heading for home, we went to the closest city, which was Barrie, Ontario, filed a report with a policeman who seemed more shaken than us, and headed home. My ex never went back to that roofing job again. He had someone else finish it, and he went to another one. I wanted to go back, but after telling people what happened, I couldn't find anyone to go with me. My ex and I continued various explorations, but we both started carrying knives. I still carry one to this day, even when I hike. I have not read of anyone else having similar experiences at Satan's Castle. Recently, my cousin, who is also an explorer, contacted me with the place she wanted to explore. Guess where? And guess what? We have made arrangements to go there in the next couple of weeks. So, on that note, and many years later, Satan's Castle Cult, let's hope we don't meet again, and to any other urban explorers out there, please be careful. You never know what you might come across in these abandoned places.
to start, my family lives in a small town in central Minnesota, and things like this hardly ever happen here. It was a startling surprise. Anyways, one night my mother and grandmother decided to go shopping at Target in a nearby town for groceries and a couple other things from my grandma's house. They pulled into the parking lot, entered the store, and began shopping. Pretty normal night so far. My grandma and my mom usually shop separately, so they both grabbed carts and went off in their own directions. This is where things got a bit weird. My mom and grandma both noticed this rather strange man wearing a t-shirt and bland jeans, aimlessly walking the empty aisles of the Target, seemingly with no objective. My mom had noticed him a few times at that point, always in the same aisle as her, and each time he had to have been throwing small glances at her, trying really hard to be inconspicuous, but failing. He would just stand there and throw glances at her whilst pretending to browse the shelves. My mom was starting to get a bit creeped out at this point, but she tried to brush it off. My mom moved on to another aisle to look for Gatorade cases and happened to lose him for a little while. My mother, now feeling a little better because the man was nowhere to be found, picked up some Gatorade, threw it in the cart, and glanced at her list once more. Just as she was about to move on to the chip aisle, she received an ominous call from my grandma. Evidently, after my mom left the aisle, the man was gone. My grandmother noticed the same man speed walking down the center aisle of the grocery section, looking down each aisle for my mom, turning his head wildly in every direction. My grandmother told her to be careful, and my mom agreed and hung up to hurry and finish up her shopping. As they were finishing up, my mom went over to the card shelf to look at a couple of things. As she was doing so, the man seemed to appear out of nowhere. My mom nearly plowed him over with her car. She quickly apologized, but as soon as she saw his face, she made a beeline for the checkout only 50 feet away where my grandma was waiting. My mom and grandma checked out together, hearts pounding as the man walked up right behind them in the checkout line, a little too close. The man was apparently hunched over, his head concealed as he was facing away from them, taking notes or something on a small notepad, while again looking at them every once in a while. My mom was beginning to feel sick from fear at this point, and as soon as they paid, they took off quickly out the door to my mom's large SUV. The man was buying two small glass cups, giving them time to run off as he checked out. Unfortunately, my mom and grandma had only just begun to unload their groceries into the SUV when he came out, staring them down as he did. He strode over to his white Ford Escape, which was parked just across the lot from my mom, and he got into it, holding his shopping bag with the two cups. Now my mom and grandma were frantic. They basically threw the remainder of the groceries into the back of the SUV and took off, trying to lose the man. Sure enough, he followed. My mom was still not completely sure what to do and drove the normal route to the highway where she decided to try something. At the junction to the highway that leads to our hometown, instead of continuing straight on the current road, my mom abruptly slammed on the brakes and turned right onto the highway towards our town, pedal to the metal. My mom regrets doing this because the man from Target did the exact same thing. The distance my mom put between her and the man was closed quickly when he caught up to her, tailgating her SUV incredibly closely. At this point, my mom was freaking out. Her knees were shaking. They were only about five miles from home at this point, and they were out in the middle of nowhere. Not knowing what to do, she continued accelerating up to 90 miles per hour to try and put more distance between them. Sure enough, he did the same and caught up again. After what seemed like a whole day, they finally reached town. At the first stoplight, my mom slammed on her brakes and took a hard right onto the first road in town. The man, 
not expecting this, continued on. My mom, thinking this was all over, pulled into the McDonald's just off the road and took a few breaths before getting back on the road. She turned onto a frontage road and headed towards our home, now only one mile away, but nearly had a heart attack when she noticed a pair of headlights belonging to a familiar white Ford Escape turning onto the same frontage road from the next street up. The man must have turned right at the next lane, my mom told herself. It was like time suddenly slowed down as they passed each other. Upon seeing my mom's SUV, the man slammed on his brakes in the middle of the road and made an illegal U-turn to get back on her tail. My mom was nearly crying. She made another abrupt turn without signaling onto the road the police station was located on, hoping to lose him. She pulled into the brightly lit police station parking lot and just sat there for a while. The man must have noticed the building she was parked in front of because he just continued on and parked in the parking lot of the adjacent apartment building and literally sat there and watched to see her next move. Regretfully, my mom didn't call 911 at this point, mainly because she was frozen with fear. My mom and grandma probably stayed parked at the police station for at least 30 minutes until the man left the lot and drove off. They didn't leave the police station until at least 15 minutes after that. They never saw the white escape after that. My mom dropped my grandma off at her house and then drove back home to ours. She got no sleep that night. The next morning, my mom called the police and filed a report. They took his description along with his cars and said they would get back to her. Fast forward to the following Sunday. My mother received a call whilst enjoying a Mother Day's drink with Grandma at our house. It was the sheriff, and he had some news on the stalker. Apparently, he lived in a town 45 minutes southeast of our town in an apartment. Here's the real kicker, though. That apartment hasn't been occupied for at least three months. We really don't know where to go from here. This man could literally be anywhere and that's been freaking my whole family out. We don't know if he somehow found out our address or anything. The sheriff just told my mom that they would keep watch on our neighborhood for the next few days. They told her to call 911 immediately if she sees anything out of place. This event has really shaken my mom and grandma up, and my dad has been in a near-shaking rage over the last two days over it. I just hope this is the last time we ever hear of this crazed fuck. When I was 18, I spent a lot of time in the Cahuta wilderness. My favorite spot was a set of waterfalls several miles from the nearest parking area. Most visitors just parked in the RV area and swam in the creek right along the gravel road. In the two years I hiked those trails, I never saw anyone further in than a half mile into the trail. Anyway, one Saturday I took my girlfriend to see the waterfall since she had never seen one in person before. We set off on the trail and not 15 minutes into the walk, she grabbed my arm and got quiet and said she felt like she was being watched and had the heebie-jeebies. I assured her everything was safe. The only thing I'd ever have to worry about in my part of the woods were the occasional bear or copperhead. We continued on, but she could never shake the feeling of being watched. I just figured she wasn't used to the wilderness and was having trouble adjusting. A couple hours later, we finally reached the end of the trail and had a picnic at the bottom of the falls. After we finished eating, she tried to check her cell phone for messages and started to panic when she realized we had no service. I explained to her that there was no cell reception anywhere around for miles, that we are finally alone and can enjoy the peace and solitude, which of course made her panic. We started heading back almost immediately because she was clearly scared, and I couldn't help but smile thinking it was silly. On the way back, I explained to her how many times I'd been out here all alone and never had any problems. 
but she still couldn't shake the feeling of being watched. We were about a mile from the falls on the only trail around when we heard someone call from behind. I jumped nearly out of my skin and turned to see a man walking towards us. He had a rifle slung over his shoulder and a heavy beard with his hat tipped low. She took a small step behind me. What can I do for you? I asked, trying to sound friendly. You guys left your cell phone back by the falls, he said. I saw a slight grin behind his beard as he looked at my girlfriend. Oh, thanks for the assist, I said, extending my hand. He shook his head and told me he didn't bring it, and that it was still sitting up there, and maybe we should follow him back up there and get it ourselves. We politely declined and made our way back down the trail as quickly as we could, with him following us on the trail several feet behind. He followed us all the way back to our car, and my girlfriend showed me her cell phone, which she had all along when I opened her door. I haven't been back to that particular trail since then. I have always had an innate fear of the night. Not so much the dark, but the night itself. As a child, my imagination was overcome with stories of creatures that come alive at night and the safety offered by a house and light. I never had anything to base this fear on, until a night when I decided to go with a buddy of mine to a baseball game and got stuck at a light at 2am after dropping him off at home. Of course, that night the game went into extra innings and so I didn't get a chance to drop my friend off back home until well after 1am. Everything was fine on the way home until I hit a light right before the street that led to my house. It was a T-junction and I was turning left. The light is one of those that you think is broken until it finally turns green right when you finally decide to just run it. Of course, I pulled up right as the light turned red. I would have just ran the light, seeing as no one was there and it was closing in on 2am on a school night. But earlier that week I had heard the phrase, character is what you do when no one is looking. And for whatever reason, that was the night I decided to prove to myself that I was a man of character. Big mistake. I pulled to a stop at the light feeling good about myself, bordering on self-righteous. When I happened to look out my window to my left, I noticed a lady sitting all alone on a bus bench. We made brief eye contact and I quickly looked away, but it was too late. I could see the movement out of my peripheral vision and knew she was coming my way. I looked out the window and noticed she was carrying a bag. I quickly checked that my doors were locked and all my windows were up. I then moved my right foot above the accelerator just in case and braced myself for what was to come. I was hoping it would just be an awkward exchange and was praying for a quick light change before she reached me so I could just get out of there. I knew there was a slim chance of that. She walked right up to my window, put down her bag and began to tap on my window. I nervously looked up at her and she motioned for me to put my window down. I had automatic windows so I just imagined pushing too hard on the window button and that thing just coming all the way down. So I took a deep breath and lightly flicked it with my finger. The window moved microscopically down, but she did not seem to notice or care. She then leaned in and began to talk. She said, My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? I should stop and give a brief physical description of the bag lady. She was small and skinny and of indeterminate age. She was either in her mid-twenties and had lived a hard 20-plus years on the street, or she was a 60-something-year-old who had lived a moderately hard life on the street. All that to say, just by looking at her, there was no way to verify her story. She looked beat up by life, not just by a boyfriend. But there was something about her delivery. It was robotic and seemed practiced and like she was disconnected from the moment. That made my skin crawl. 
and after a brief, about a second debate on whether I should do it, I told her that I had to get home and could not give her a ride. After my first refusal, she leaned in closer and said the same thing again. My boyfriend beat me up. I have a friend who lives down the street. Can you give me a ride? This time I felt more confident when I declined to give her a ride and told her I had a curfew and had to get home. She leaned in a third time and began her statement again. My boyfriend beat me. At this point the light changed. I slowly lifted my foot off the brake and started slowly rolling forward and began muttering an apology. She didn't move. She just looked at the light then looked at me, leaned in closer and said five words that have haunted me ever since. You made the right decision. Then she picked up her bag and walked back towards the bench. I peeled out of the intersection and cried and screamed all the way home. I have no idea what she planned to do or if there were people waiting to jump in my car from the bushes had I moved to let her in. But that encounter has haunted me ever since and has confirmed in my mind that nothing good happens after dark. I've been living on my own with my boyfriend for almost two years now. I recently had a break-in while I was home about a week ago. It was early in the morning at about 3 a.m., night time for most of you. My boyfriend works night shift, so he wasn't home at the time it happened. I was on my phone when I thought I heard someone coming up the outside stairs. There was a snowstorm that night, and it was really windy, so I didn't think much of what I heard outside. I was just about to close my eyes and go to sleep when I heard my front door being opened. I thought it was my boyfriend, so I was going to call out his name and I did, to realize that was a big mistake. Now my house is a one bedroom apartment, so there isn't really anywhere to hide at all, especially when I was stuck in my room. Now, my bedroom door doesn't have a doorknob on it because it broke so it's kind of tricky for someone to get it. The only place I had to hide was on my bed behind a small wall that was still very visible. I grab a knife my boyfriend has on his dresser and hid. I could hear someone was trying to get into my room. It was one of the most intense things that's ever happened in my life. I held my breath and was ready to start screaming and kicking and scaring whoever it was with a knife as much as I could. And I knew my downstairs neighbors would hear me. They would come upstairs or call the police. The door swung open, and I saw a tall man with a mask over his head, wearing a black hoodie. He saw me and was headed for me, but I screamed and tried to kick him in his knees. I ended up kicking him in the dick, and he fell down immediately. He stood back up and I ran for the front door. I saw the front door open. It was my boyfriend who'd been dropped off by his friend from work. I pushed him out of the house immediately and told him what was going on. He told me to run downstairs to his buddy's car and tell him what was going on and to stay with him in the car safe. He took the knife from me and stayed in the front room. I ran outside to Josh's car and told him everything. He stayed in the parking lot and he called the police. But then we heard a gunshot. Thank God my boyfriend didn't get shot, but the bullets did go into the door and nearly hit my boyfriend in his leg. If it wasn't for my boyfriend and his friend coming home early that night, I think I would have been dead. It was my turn to take my kids trick-or-treating. The previous year, it was my wife's, and we'd trade back and forth every year. My son and daughter were ages seven and nine. Usually, I stay on the streets while my kids go up to different houses to collect candy. 
After about half an hour of walking around, we came to one of the more popular hotspots for candy collecting. A main street in the neighborhood, lots of really cool decorations and animatronics on people's lawns, so I became a bit distracted and stopped watching my kids closely. At one point, they came back from a house accompanied by another girl about the same height as my daughter. She was wearing a weird homemade mask, like a cardboard cutout or something. My daughter asked me if she could trick or treat with us, so I said sure, and we carried on together as a group. I didn't know who this girl was, but I figured she was a friend from school. As we continued, I started to notice a large man trailing us. He was wearing some sort of angry cat mask. It was kind of creepy, to be honest. I thought that maybe he was the father of the girl, so I tried to start up some small chat with him. I said something like, Nice weather, eh? But he didn't respond. He just stood there, staring at me, while our kids went up the stairs to the next house. I tried again, asking, uh, Hey, is that your daughter? He nodded, but didn't say anything. I figured he just wasn't in the mood for chatting, so I stopped trying. We carried on for about another 15 minutes until suddenly my kids came up to me and said they wanted to go home. This surprised me as we hadn't been out for too long and their bags were only about a third full. In any case, I agreed, waved goodbye at the man in the cat mask and his daughter and started on our way home. The weird thing is that when I glanced back, the man and his daughter were just standing there, staring at us. I checked one more time as we turned the corner, and they were still standing there, not moving at all. At this point, I decided to ask my kids, So, who was that girl? My daughter looked at me with a confused look on her face. She's your friend, my daughter replied. I asked her what she meant. Apparently, the girl with the cardboard mask approached them and said she was a friend of mine. She told my daughter she was too shy to ask me if she could join us to trick or treat and wanted my daughter to ask me instead. I laughed at this story and replied to my daughter, Why would you think she was my friend? I don't have any children friends. What my daughter said next chilled my bones. According to her, when the girl with the cardboard mask approached them for the first time, she wasn't wearing the mask, so they were able to see her face. As it turns out, she wasn't a girl at all, but an older woman around my age, with wrinkles on her face. What's even more disturbing, the old woman had started to steal treats from my daughter's bag, apparently when I wasn't looking. This is why they asked me to go home. The old woman was creeping them out, and they wanted to just get away from her. I brought my kids home and told my wife what happened. We made sure to check through all their candy, but couldn't find anything suspicious or off. We didn't call the police or anything since nothing really happened, but thinking back, I kind of regret that decision now. What the heck was the old woman doing, and who the hell was that man following us around? I don't think I'll ever know. I just think it's sick that there are people out there on Halloween hiding behind masks, pretending to be children. This happened to me eight years ago, and will haunt me for the rest of my life. I grew up in one of the most densely populated neighborhoods in all of North America. The neighborhood was initially supposed to house 12,000 people, but by the time I was 12 years old, it had a population of around 30,000 people. It was one of Toronto's poorest neighborhoods, with 50% of the population being under the poverty line, though the crime rate was not nearly as high as you'd expect it to be. The neighborhood was mostly made up of immigrants and refugees looking to find a better life, my family included. It was summer break between 5th and 6th grade, and my cousins were at our place watching movies. I was getting hungry, so I grabbed some money and headed for the convenience store to get snacks. It was around 7pm, so the sun was still up, and there was an hour and a half left of light. The convenience store was a half a block away, so I walked it. 
When I got to the parking lot of the residential building the store was in, I noticed a man wearing a black hoodie with horizontal green stripes standing in the corner of the parking lot. There was nothing too noticeable about the man except that he was smoking directly under a no-smoking sign. Nothing uncommon in that neighborhood, just kind of ironic. I walk up the steps and into the cramped convenience store. There might have been seven people in there, but it looked as if it was already almost full. It was probably as big as a mid-sized apartment and was already stocked up to the ceiling. The point is, if anyone enters, everyone in the store knows. So I go in and directly to the left of the entrance is a shelf packed with many different varieties of candy. I was like any other child who has 20 different varieties of candy laid out in front of them, but only has the budget for two. Lost in thought. At the moment, I forget about the man who was smoking. He enters through the door. He walks into the nook of the store behind me, where they keep all the flatbread. I can feel his gaze on the back of my head. I quickly decide on the snacks, pay, and leave. I walk out, down the steps, and to the sidewalk, on the other side of the narrow parking lot. When I hear the chimes of the exit door, I glance behind me to see who is exiting the store, and I'm a shade under petrified when I see the man exit the store, especially when I notice he's carrying nothing in his hands. I quicken my pace just a tad and reason with myself that he just bought another pack of cigarettes and he just put it in his pockets. That idea had barely crossed my mind by the time I'm halfway back to my building. I turn around to see if he's still there. He's maybe 15 feet away from me when we make eye contact. He has his hood off and I can see his face clearly. He has scars covering his face and he's balding on top. He couldn't have been too tall because he wasn't much taller than 6th grade me, so maybe 5'4 or 5'6. I spin back around and start to speed up, and I hear footsteps quicken behind me. By the time we got to the D-shaped driveway to my building, we were speed walking. As soon as we hit the split in the sidewalk, which separates the driveway and the straight path, I start sprinting at full speed to my building. Luckily there was someone buzzing in at that exact moment, and I slipped in the door behind him. I quickly whirl around and pull the pneumatic glass door shut. When I look up, I see the man, seconds too late, on the other side of the glass door. The look on his face still scares me. He stared at me with an expression of anger that I'd never seen before, nor have seen since. I run to the elevators and push the button. He starts rattling the door. The expression on his face was still sinister. When the elevator comes down, he understands that he won't catch me. He leaves the way we came. So, this was three years ago, right before the pandemic hit, and it's now one of my favorite stories to tell now. I'm no longer scared. No. I moved thousands of miles away, and a few years have passed. My husband was in the military during this time. I was a housewife due to work being hard to get to in this area. I couldn't drive and live off base. Well, any military person knows military schedule is pretty darn predictable and much of our lives ran on an easy to memorize schedule. And to make matters worse, my husband was often gone for long hours. So for about two to three months, I had been seeing this guy wandering around my home, peeking into the windows. Honestly, I didn't originally think much of it, beyond being weirded out, you know. 
Like, we didn't have anything that would interest a robber. No TV. A single seven-year-old computer. A broken couch and table. A mattress on the floor. Literally nothing expensive in our home. Uh, Beyond a, a gun that was locked up in a safe that may have looked like it held valuables, but... It seemed like a lot of work to case what looked like the home of people living in poverty. So, I didn't think anything of it. Yet, he kept coming back when my husband was gone. I'd see him every few days. Or, um... Or hear him, due to my normally super sweet cat, hating him and hissing and yowling when he saw him. I'd know he was there when I heard my cat making an angry fuss. One day, I went out with my husband, and I guess I didn't lock the door properly. Well, as our lock could be a bit funny, and uh, I was running late. According to our normal schedule, this is the time that I would have gone to base with my husband for family mandatory fun, and then come back home alone in an Uber while my husband stayed on base to work or hang out with his friends or whatever. This day, though, I fell sick with a migraine. I have hemiplegic migraine, so it can be serious. And his sergeant told him to take me home and you know, take care of me when he saw how ill I was. Now, before I go on, I should probably describe my old home. Uh, let's see, okay, so... I lived in a two-bedroom apartment complex in the mountains. It was a massive complex. My home layout was this. My front door led to my kitchen and dining area, Right? And on my kitchen and dining area wall, next to my door, was another glass door. Think a patio door. And across from my kitchen was my room. Then you go down the hall and hit the living room that has another glass door wall next to the fireplace. And finally, after that, you go across the living room at the end of the hall and you hit our guest room with yet another glass door wall. (laughs) I was literally surrounded by giant glass doors. Then outside, we had a porch. There was a a storage closet where I usually kept my bike, as I couldn't drive due to my migraines and seizures. Okay, so now that I've set the scene, back to the story. So, when my husband brought me home again, Not per our normal schedule, we came home to find our door slightly ajar. We gave each other a look and went inside anyways with me mumbling how I must have not locked properly due to us being in a rush that morning. We walked into the kitchen where my husband immediately went to the fridge and started looking around for water for himself and me. He then spoke for the first time while in the fridge Honestly, I don't remember what he even said. But then, we heard something maybe a few seconds after he spoke. Our porch glass door in the back of our home moved. We both knew the sound really well, as I like to sit on the porch reading for hours, so I was always coming in and out, right? So then, he grabbed my shoulder and whispered to grab his gun from our room. And he then grabbed the butcher's knife and went towards the living room. I went and grabbed the gun, noticing on my way into our room that down the hall, our living room glass porch door was wide open. So, after giving my husband the gun, I followed behind him as he did a sweep of our home. I dialed 911 and told them I had an active break-in. I was on the phone upon coming back down the hall towards the kitchen to see if he went around back and around the house to the front. This would have been the only way out of the area, as we lived on a mountainside and 
One side was blocked off. We heard the storage door out back that we had forgotten to shut slam open. My husband and I ran out back where we found our storage door swinging open and just barely saw the same guy who'd been spying on me in our home. He didn't end up coming back that day. I also later found the only things missing were some of my clothes, lingerie, and bathroom care products. The police showed up four hours later and took a statement from my husband and me. Eventually, my husband had to return to his normal schedule. Now, I was terrified, and he didn't like it. But we also had no choice until we could find a new place after our contract ended in three months' time. The first weeks were fine. He didn't come back. My cat didn't yowl or throw any fits, so he didn't see him either. Things were fine that week. Then, another week went by. And I started to think maybe the gun we brought out scared him. Uh, no. The third week, he ended up coming back while my husband was at work in the morning. He first tried the door and was trying to force it open and then started banging on the glass next to the door. I put 911 on the speaker and texted my husband while I panicked and cried while I was on the 911 call, he ended up giving up on the front door, and when I relayed this to the dispatcher, she spoke to me like I was being ridiculous for freaking out this badly over someone trying to get in my locked door. I hung up and finally called my husband while I had a full-on panic attack, and it turns out he was already coming home with a, a car full of his and my friends also, who were also in the army. The man ended up going to the back door and trying both glass doors there as well before finally giving up. About four minutes later, my husband and his friends arrived and found me clutching my cat and crying. They ended up scanning the area and still didn't find him. The cops showed up seven hours later, and I, very angry at this time, gave another report. Three of the guys ended up sleeping over in the spare room, and my husband and I slept in our now locked and bolted bedroom. I got a lock installed on the bedroom door after the first time. The next day, mine and my husband's friends went out and got and installed cameras in all our doors and window areas. Since the last incident, he returned to look in our windows on three more occasions. I never had another issue in that house, as I moved out shortly after. I was four or five when this happened, so I don't have a lot of details. I lived in a housing development for the first six or seven years of my life. During the summer, it was common for the first kid outside during the summer to kind of holler through a window or knock on the door of literally any house and ask if that kid lived there could come out and play. At the end of any given day, there was usually a group of 5 to 15 kids. We were loud, but we were actually pretty behaved, and I think most of the parents liked that it was pretty easy to get us out of their hair but also not completely lose track of anyone. Often, I was the first kid up in the morning, and a new family moved in across the street the day before. I had seen a mom, a girl, I'm thinking nine, and a boy that might have been three or so. So the next morning after they moved in, I set my sights on their apartment. I crossed the street and made eye contact with a nine-year-old girl, who was already staring out of one of her windows that faced the sidewalk, and I yelled, Wanna come out and play? She blankly stared at me for a few seconds, and said rather complacently, I'll go ask my mom. And a few minutes later, she was outside. After some running around, we decided we were gonna play, doctors. She crudely pretended to do surgery on me with sidewalk chalk and sticks, while I played dead on the sidewalk. I kept asking her if she was done, 
but she kept insisting she was not. Finally, she told me she had to do one more procedure and I'd be free to go, but I had to close my eyes. We went back and forth about it, but in the end, I reluctantly agreed to shut my eyes. After a minute or so, I got a really bad feeling in my gut. I opened my eyes and the girl's eyes were wide with some kind of dark look. She had a large chunk of broken concrete, a bit bigger than the average grapefruit, clutched between both her hands and held high over her head. She quickly tried to stuff the rock under her summer dress between her knees to hide it, but I sat up and asked her what she was doing. She said, You weren't supposed to open your eyes. I was gonna smash your head. I yelled. I would have told my mom if you hit me with that. I was five. Cut me some slack. She gave me the most foul look I've ever seen from a child in all of my life. Her eyes were dark. She looked furious, almost inhuman, and she said, you would have bled to death before you could tell on me. I backed up into the road and she stood up and started to walk towards me, leaving the rock behind on the sidewalk. I booked it across the street and into my apartment, and when I looked out the window, she was gone. Twice after that, I noticed her in the raggedy pine tree outside my bedroom window, staring at me. I was on the second floor. She had climbed the tree to watch me in my bedroom. I used my curtains after that. I did tell my mom, but she didn't believe me. I avoided her until I moved away. Sonia, I hope you're okay. Hopefully you got some therapy. But between the murder rock and the window peeping, I don't want any further creepy encounters with you. I'm going to tell you a story that happened when I was 17. This story still freaks me out so much, and I don't even know what happened that day. I would like to have your opinion on it. It was in November, and my friend Jacob was going to have his birthday for these 17 years. Me, being a good friend, I proposed to him to sleep at my house, and then go for a walk the next day with friends in the forest. He accepts. Everything goes well. He sleeps at my place, and the next day, we leave with friends for two hours of road. After the road, I realized that I forgot the keys to my house at home, and that therefore, the door to my house was not locked. But hey, I tell myself that we are in town, and that people frequent to the suburbs to fly. The day is going well, and it's time to go home. I was stressed about knowing if my house had been robbed. Then, in the end, I said to myself that there was little chance... My friend Jacob wanted to spend more time with me before I left for my studies, and so did he, so I accepted that he still sleeps with me. We get back to my house and we walk in. We see that it's intact, but it was nice and wide open, so I walked around the house and noticed something. The cellar door was open, and there was white paper on the floor. I quickly realized that we had to call the police and check if anyone was there to reassure us. Me and Jacob decided to shout that if the stranger didn't come out, the police would take care of it. I was paralyzed with fear, and I feared that the stranger was coming. And bad news, the stranger who was in the cellar cried, You are not at home. Get out of where I locked you up. Jacob got scared and asked me to come see if the police were there. Luckily, there was an officer there. She got the stranger and put him in the car. And upon searching, the police found kitchen knives, an axe, iron chains, and a board. There was also a white sheet on which was written, Behind You. I didn't understand from the beginning. The police told me later 
that the individual ran away from an asylum. Today, I'm 25, and now I always check if I have the keys on me or not. I'm a 24-year-old male who was born and raised in northern New England. I grew up hearing all the scary stories and urban legends that haunted my dreams. But there was one local legend that everyone in my high school knew about. Monkey Town. Monkey Town was supposed to be a Christian retreat camp. You'd have to take this road in between a funeral home and a cemetery down this big hill and you'd eventually enter what looks like the set from the movie The Village. It was a big circle of old-style homes with a big white church in the middle. I'll describe it more later in the story, but it was always a dare to see how far you could walk down into the camp without chickening out. I remember a couple of times in middle school, a few friends and I made it halfway down the hill and then bitched out. The year was 2011, junior year. I had just gotten my license and my first car, a classic Chevy Blazer. One night, I was driving around with two friends, one who went to the same high school as me, let's call her Bessie, and one who didn't, we'll call him Kale. Bessie and I thought it might be funny to take Kale down to Monkey Town and see what happens. So, the three of us hopped into my blazer, and there we went. I remember putting on some of the instrumental music from the movie Halloween just to set the mood. How dumb was I? As we got down the hill, mind you, we are still in the car the entire time, we made our way around the circle, mesmerized by this entire community, separated from society. One thing that stuck out was this red light at the top of the church's steeple. Then, out of the corner of my eye, I saw movement. That's when I remember thinking, no fucking way. I quickly turned my head to my left and see a giant man in overalls running full speed towards my car. The most fucked up part about this man is he was carrying a bat or tool of some sort. I didn't even think. I slammed on the gas, and we got the hell out of there. The three of us couldn't believe what the fuck just happened. I'm pretty sure we just went back to my house to recover from the scare. We passed out. All was well. The next day, I was chilling with another friend, James, and his girlfriend, Sadie. I had told them about last night's events, and they, sure as shit, didn't buy it. Me, a 17-year-old teenage boy, wanted to prove them wrong, so we all jumped into my blazer and headed back to Monkey Town. This time, my blazer was full. We had picked up two other girls, who coincidentally had the same name, and another buddy of mine, Joe. I made James drive my blazer and I sat shotgun. As we all headed down, the tension rose. We got halfway around the circle until one of the girls started screaming. This time, there were at least five men running at my car, and three of them definitely had weapons. James didn't know what to do. It's like he froze. The men were all yelling, Get the fuck out of the car. They were legitimately shaking my car back and forth. I remember being crouched down so far into the seat as if that did anything. Finally, James slammed on the gas and we peeled out of there. As I began taking all of my friends home, I got a call from my mom. Apparently, two police officers were in my kitchen. One of the Monkey Town civilians had called the police and told them we tried to run them over. What bullshit. I was furious. We raced to my house to explain to the officers what actually happened. All in all, the cops didn't seem too interested. No crime was committed. To this day, 
I can't help but think what would have happened if we had gotten out of the car. What kind of Christian retreat camp is that? When I was younger, every year for Christmas, I would drive upstate to my aunt's house along a stretch of highway. I cannot for the life of me remember the name of this road. All I know is it runs nearby Akron, New York at some point. However, most of the drive is through rural areas with little to no towns nearby. It was the dead of night and my groggy self had gotten off a long shift and had to drag my ass to my aunt's house since my extended family was expecting me the following morning. Near halfway through the drive, I realized I was low on gas, which irritated me. My brother told me he had filled up the day before, so he either forgot or was straight lying. I saw an archaic looking sign for a gas station off the next road. It wasn't an official road sign, literally a pole with a slab of metal attached with gas off next exit or something along those lines painted on. It seemed a little sketchy, but people do the same thing with fruit stands on highways, so whatever. I pulled off the next exit on some dilapidated country-ass road through dense woods. The whole thing was creepy and surreal. I kept expecting Leatherface to come running out of the trees with a chainsaw. Anyways, eventually, I came to the gas station and I realized quickly it hadn't been open for years. It was all rusted and the convenience store's roof was caving in. The gas pumps had all been taken out as well. I pulled over next to it and checked my gauge. I would probably only make it another half mile before running out, so I called AAA and they said they'd send a truck over. Now I played the waiting game. I left my engine on because when the headlights were off, everything was pitch black. And my paranoid self wasn't sitting next to an abandoned gas station in the middle of a forest in complete darkness. Most of the wait went uneventful until I sensed movement around the side of the old store, right where my lights were pointed. I look up, but didn't see anything anymore. So I look back down at my phone. Then over the sounds of the night, I hear someone yell in a demanding tone, Hey buddy, come here. I look up, and I shit you not, there's a dude standing by the old store, looking towards me, illuminated by my headlights. He looked like a run-of-the-mill homeless guy. I was honestly spooked, and figured he must have been squatting there, still watching him. I rolled down my window, and yelled something like, yeah, what's up? Still mentally crapping myself. I had my foot ready to floor it out of there at the first sign of trouble. You got any change? Nah, I don't. Sorry, man. I look up at him. He has this kind of vacant expression and is standing stiff. Then I see movement. There are heads. About 20 or so peeking around trees beyond this man that I'm talking to. I can't see them clearly at all, but they are definitely people, literally just heads, staring in my direction from around the trees. I see another guy beginning to walk around from the gas station, and then I turned around and sped off. I got as far away from that place as my tank could carry me, and then updated AAA on my location. The driver came back over and filled me up. I didn't say anything. After he left, I wanted to call the cops. So I called the nearest town's sheriff department. They said they'd send a trooper over, and I gave them the location. When I got to my aunt's house, they called me back and said whoever was there was gone. But they could tell a large number of people had been living there for a while. Blankets, canned food the usual. The whole situation still freaks me out. But frankly, I consider myself lucky. I'll always have a creepy story to tell. I'm just glad nothing bad happened.
It was about 1.30 in the morning. I just got home at 1 from hanging with my cousins. I'm in the Midwest, and we were getting slammed all night by the runoff of the hurricane weather down south. So I'm driving and coming up to my house in a downpour and winds that almost knocked me over. I'm on my porch, waiting for my brother to come unlock the door, when I look behind me and see a guy walking toward me. Now, we're no strangers to people going past our house. We're at the end of the first side road in a good-sized neighborhood, and to the left of us is a walking trail. Just before that, we have a fire station with a large parking lot, and across the street from that is a party store and some apartments. So it's not uncommon to see someone going past the side of our house beyond the fence or down our road at all times of the night. But again, it's been storming bad all night. Who's going out in this? This guy is maybe 500 to 600 feet away from me, straddling the lines between the fire station lot and my neighbor's yard. He's limping a little, and I can sort of make out his silhouette, bulky with a hat on. Those fuzzy lumberjack hats, like the one Cousin Eddie wears in Christmas Vacation. The longer I wait, the closer he gets. It felt like a good five minutes before my brother finally opens the door. I slide in and spend twenty seconds trying to fiddle the deadbolt in place. I sneak over to the far edge of the living room window to look outside, and he's heading toward my house. We have a dresser in our yard that my mom's fixing up, and this guy was right behind it, walking up our walkway. At this point, I start really freaking out. I could see him a bit better now with the porch light on. He had a jacket over maybe a sweatshirt and that furry hat on, and for some reason, a face mask. It was just a regular disposable one. This guy's making a beeline straight for my porch. I'm on autopilot now. I rush to the kitchen and shut the light off. With it on, you can see a shadow straight onto the living room window. I wanted the element of surprise on this guy. With that, I head back to the window as quietly as I could, and I look outside. The guy is gone. I glance to my porch, into the yard, down the road. There was no sign of him anywhere. I didn't even hear him come off my porch, which you usually can. It's all dead leaves on the side of the house. I didn't hear any crunching there. Both ways into my house were locked and deadbolted. The windows are a good seven to eight feet above the ground, so it'd take some effort to get through them. I didn't hear anything. Best case scenario, the guy was just trying to stay dry for a second before walking out. But man, I still got goosebumps. This happened four years ago at my then girlfriend's house. She lives in the sticks of North Carolina with the neighbors on either side about a half a mile away. Her parents and older brother were home. And for context, we were both 15 at the time. It was around 11 p.m. on a Saturday, and a car pulled up in the driveway. The headlights shone through my girlfriend's bedroom window, and then we heard a car door shut. My girlfriend and I figured it was a family friend or someone who was coming to hang out and drink with their parents, so we didn't pay it much mind. About 10 minutes later, my ex's father comes into the room looking frantic. He tells us to lock the windows and grabbed her gun just to be safe. He walked out of the front door and we sat with her mom and brother in the kitchen. Her dad came out maybe two minutes later, walked into his bedroom and comes out with a handgun and then walks out the front door again. We had no idea what was going on, but we soon heard her dad yelling and then walked back inside saying he took care of the situation. He told us that there was a car parked in the driveway with the headlights off and a person inside the driver's seat. He said that he reached for the door handle, but the person looked up and whipped it in reverse right out of their driveway. However, he thought there was still someone in the woods because of the car door we heard. So we walked back outside with the flashlight and that gun. When he came back in, he told us to lock everything and for all of us to stay in one room. 
He said that as he was walking around the house, he shone his flashlight into the woods, and there was a trail of reflectors that were stuck to trees leading from the road to their house. They were screwed into the trees, so this was definitely premeditated. He fired his gun a few times to hopefully scare them away. Thankfully, nothing else happened, but it was a nerve-wracking experience nonetheless. Was this someone planning on robbing us, murdering us? I have no idea, but I'm glad we didn't have to find out. We all sat and slept in the living room together, and I left the next day. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, I shared a room with my older brother who was around 15. We live in the suburb area of New York, not the greatest area, but not riddled with crime. There are two windows in my room, one that overlooks the backyard and one that connects to the front porch. It came in quite handy for my brother to sneak out and meet with friends. If you step out into the window, you are on the porch, so anyone on the porch can access this window. I was never really bothered by that thought, because quite honestly, it had never crossed my mind. My bed was touching this window, while my brother's bed was perpendicular to mine. It was an odd setup, but that's besides the point. Now this was before we had any sort of smartphone or laptop to keep ourselves occupied. So on nights when we weren't sleepy, we would just stay up talking to one another, making up dumb games to pass the time. This event took place during the summer. We had stayed up late into the hours of the night, perks of having no school. It was probably around 2 a.m. and eventually we were playing a game where one of us was a goalkeeper and the other was taking a shot. We both would say at the same time, either left, center, or right. If the goalkeeper guessed the same as the one taking the shot, he would get a point. And if the other person taking the shot set a position that the other goalie said, then they got a point. We went for a couple of rounds, and I was beating his ass at this, even though that's irrelevant. I don't remember what round we were on, but we did our three, two, one countdown. And my brother, the goalkeeper, said left. I, the shooter, said center. And then... A voice from outside on the porch window said, left. My brother and I froze. We had the shade down, but my mom had left the porch light on. So that was the only light illuminating our room. The dim porch light coming in from the borders of the shade. At the time, in my house was my mother on the opposite side of the window. My sister the room over, and my dad in the basement. And then me and my brother, shitting our pants practically. We waited for what seemed like an hour, but was probably only 30 to 45 seconds. And we heard a giggle and a playful knock at the window. Let's go another round. Come on, boys, the voice said, but in a cheerful, playful tone. Honestly, I want to say it was a scary voice and sounded menacing, but it didn't. It sounded like a woman, not too old, but young. It was just normal, just like a normal sounding voice. Nothing off about it besides the fact that where it was coming from and the time it came. Me and my brother were seriously freaked out. And I was about to break down because how close I was to this woman. The thought that all I had to do was lift the shade and I'd be face to face with this person scared the shit out of me. And made me go as still and stiff as if I just looked into Medusa's eyes. After a while, me and my brother not responding, my brother started slowly moving from his bed to the door as not to make any noise. As my brother was tiptoeing towards the door, the sound of nails being ran down a window started. It started very slow, from the top to the bottom. At that point, my brother made it to the door. He looked back at me and brought his fingers to his lips, gesturing for me to keep quiet. Once those nails stopped running down my window, I heard her light footsteps make their way off the porch and then disappear into the night. I laid there for an eternity, not moving until my brother returned and I saw my mom move hastily by my door, making her way to the front door. The porch light flipped on, and I was left in darkness with my brother, waiting in the doorway for my mom's return. I heard my mom call my dad up the stairs, and his groggy, annoyed footsteps coming up. They talked, then came into me and my brother's room, and we relayed what happened. Apparently, my mom caught sight of that lady, turning out of our driveway, behind some of the tall bushes, and thank God we had a long driveway. Otherwise, my mom probably would have thought we were just crazy. Considering no harm was done besides leaving me terrified at my window, my parents didn't call the police. 
They just thought it was really weird and stayed up the rest of the night to make sure she didn't return. I'm now 17. My brother is in college, so I have the room to myself. My bed still touches that window because I'm too lazy to move the rest of the furniture in my room so I can move my bed. That shade to that window has not been open since that incident, and it probably never will be. While taking a walk to the newsstand around the corner during the afternoon, my neighbor died. I swear I was gone not even 30 minutes. I came back to EMTs and police swarming the building. It was kind of surreal how quickly it happened. I didn't know him really well, but I'd help him carry his groceries in, and he'd played with my cat once, then told me in this really sassy old man way that he preferred dogs. After it happened, a bunch of residents were gathered in the common room, including the guy's roommate who had earbuds in, listening to classical music, just staring into space with a blank look on his face. I assumed he was traumatized. One of the neighbors who was kind of a jerk was joking about how the guy probably killed himself. He started to walk over to ask him what happened, and I grabbed him, telling him not to be mean because the guy was clearly listening to classical music to calm down. We all agreed how horrific it'd be to lose a roommate, and kind of scattered. The roommate was left in the common room until about 11pm, while police waited for the body to be collected. They wouldn't let anyone back in. It's been somber since then, even though most of us didn't really know this guy. We see his roommate in the elevator in hall. He always has his headphones in. He doesn't acknowledge us, but just walks past. He said, fine, which okay, maybe he didn't want to talk to a virtual stranger. A few of the rest of us have chatted about the neighbor who's passed, and funny memories. Then, yesterday, I heard building staff talk about when they found him. He was in nothing but a diaper, laying sideways across the bed with his head almost to the floor. His roommate was sitting calmly with his side at the table, ten feet away. When the worker rushed to do CPR, she'd asked how long he'd been like that, and the roommate replied, Oh, him. About twenty minutes. It seems like it's natural causes, but the entire thing is so bizarre. Several people saw him shortly before that, fully clothed, and his roommate was just sitting there in the apartment with him while he died. It's creepy as fuck, and I'm really glad I'm moving soon. Alright, so check this out. A few months back, my girlfriend and I were bored hanging around the house and spontaneously decided to go out for a hike. We don't go hiking often, but the idea appealed to both of us and even though there was only about an hour left of daylight, we figured we had enough time to go enjoy a hike before it got too dark. We quickly fill up our water bottles and put on the best walking shoes we had and we were out the door driving up into the mountains. Around my area, there are many hiking trails, with the variety of trails increasing as you go up into the mountains. We tended to stay around the base of the mountains in the occasional case of us hiking, where most people would still be walking, but we wanted to change things up and progressed further up the mountain road to a trail a friend of mine had mentioned. We kept in mind our time and figured that we could hike for a bit and simply enjoy the new environment for us and finish up before it was too late. We arrived at the trailhead and see that there were no cars left along the road where the trail commences, but we didn't think much of it due to the time. We still had a good 45 minutes until dark, so we continued on. We start walking down a fairly steep hill that then recoups the elevation at the bottom 
with an equally steep hill that you have to ascend. We reach the top, and then it's smooth sailing from there. We see a lone coyote off of the trail a ways off, and some rabbits, and I made a quip about how those rabbits might need to be careful with that coyote lurking around. She playfully hit me for that one. Approximately less than a mile into the trail, we see a large, fallen tree that made a bridge over a dried riverbed and decided to take a rest, to climb around on it, and take some pictures. We're there for about 10 minutes. We then resume hiking. We continue on the trail for a short distance until she hears a rustle in the trees behind us. We stop, mildly spooked due to the assumed size of whatever made that rustling, but continue on briefly before she decides that she's done and that we need to head back. It's twilight now, so I agree with her and we turn around and head back to the car. When we made it back to the fallen tree, my shoe had come untied, so I used the trunk to fix my loose laces and look behind us for the first time on the hike, which is uncharacteristic for me, but hey, I was having fun. Why should I be paranoid? Well, I see a person dressed entirely in black with their hood on that was a significant distance behind us, walking at a slow, even pace. It wasn't something totally out of the ordinary, so what if they were wearing black with their hood on? I wear black most of the time and it's cold out. I shouldn't make assumptions. This does trigger me to be more alert, however, and I inform my girlfriend of this person's presence. It's now dusk, and we continue on at an intentionally faster pace and go through a winding section of the trail, and I eventually lose sight of the person. When we come around the final bend of the section, I figure they're far behind us and that there's nothing to worry about. Sooner than later, the person is behind us again, but much closer. They're probably 50 feet closer now in comparison to the 100 feet they were before, and we had increased our speed, so this alarmed us. We briskly walk around another bend, and as soon as we come around it, we book it. It seemed to be a natural reaction on both of our parts as we just started running without a word said to initiate it. We're nearing the trail ahead now, with only the hills to deal with, we catch our breaths for a moment and I turn around again. I see the person seemingly halt a sprint upon noticing me look back, as if they were trying to uphold the illusion of simply walking. At this point, I shout, go, and we sprint down the hill. What little light was left struggled to make its way through the dense trees that surrounded us and the steep hill proved challenging to run down without a clear path to be seen. We both stumbled down the hill, almost falling multiple times and slamming our feet onto rocks and loose brush, but we didn't fall and we didn't look behind us. We make it to the bottom, but must continue up the initial hill and then we'll have made it out. We persevere up the incline and make it back to our car. I briefly breathe in relief as I start my car, heart pounding and adrenaline racing. As I reverse onto the road, the person emerges at the trailhead, apparently breathing heavily. We finally get a glimpse of him. His hood had fallen off his head, exposing his pale complexion and dead eyes that were only illuminated by a single lantern at the start of the trail. He was holding something in his hand but it was too dark to see and I wasn't interested in sticking around to make out the object. I shift into drive and accelerate as fast as my car could muster, leaving him behind in the dust of the empty side of the road. Hey, night trail stalker dude, let's not meet. So I was out skating at the beach. It was nighttime, and there didn't appear to be anyone around for quite a ways, except for this group of like seven guys that seemed to be loitering in the middle of the path, for whatever reason. Anywho, as I'm riding in that direction, they all move to the sides of the path for me. 
What's strange, though, is they all have these huge grins on their faces, and they're waving at me. One of them says, Do you need a lift? As I'm passing by. Before registering what he just said, I politely wave and say hello. I felt this strange sick feeling in my stomach, though, and I don't know why, but his smile made me really uncomfortable. Now, as I'm skating away, I can hear footsteps right behind me, running really fast. They stop after a few seconds though, and I ride away. So yeah, I'm kind of worried about this, and wondering what the hell just happened. When I was about 23, my girlfriend and I were living in an apartment building in Phoenix. Our downstairs neighbor clearly had some mental issues going on. He was probably in his 60s, really skinny, always wore really tight tank tops and short shorts around. This is not the mental issue part. The apartments were built in the 70s. Obviously, they'd been renovated since then. Instead of the horizontal blinds, they had the vertical shitty ones now. No more carpet, updated appliances, you know what renovations are. But his apartment hadn't been, it was exactly the same. Only his, in the whole complex. I only know this because he usually has his blinds open and I had to walk by his place to get to the stairs. He would always yell and bang things around in his apartment. And when it rained, he would go up to the roof and just scream, I mean yell at the sky. And when he wasn't yelling at the sky, he was yelling, dang it, in his apartment over and over and over. And he would come outside and pace around, mumbling to himself when it was raining. Now the creepy part. I was into photography at the time, and there was rain and lightning, so my girlfriend, my friend Chris and his girlfriend, went to the roof to try and get shots of the lightning. Of course, my neighbor, the wild man, was on the fourth floor on his way to open the area of the roof. He asked us what we were doing. This was the first interaction I've had with the guy, even though I saw him around all the time. I told him we were trying to take pictures of the lightning. Why the hell would you want to do that? That's stupid, he said. So we just said okay dude and went on our way. He followed us over to the roof. So we said fuck it, we're leaving. We walked over to the elevator and he followed us again. We got into the elevator and he just stood outside of it looking at us. I put my girlfriend behind me and Chris did the same. I don't know what this guy was about to do. He just stood there. The doors closed and we all kind of chuckled and sighed out of relief. Then, like a horror movie, the doors opened up again and my neighbor was standing there. He told us to go away and I told him, that's what we're trying to do. The doors closed again and the elevator went down. We all went back to my apartment and were considerably freaked out. I hope you enjoyed that. A huge thank you to all my guests for helping me bring you this video. You can find links to all their channels in the video description. I want to give a special shout out to Jay Nightmares for sourcing and translating some of these stories. Check out his channel for more like this. He translates his stories from Japanese, so you're unlikely to have heard them before. You can find a link in the description. I'll be back with a special episode tomorrow the third installment of the Urban Legend series, Two Down, One More Left to Die. Stay safe on Halloween night. I'd like to thank my channel members and patrons for the support. Brooke, Snowball Rathena, Janice, Dez, Borderline Betty, Crafty Kel, 
Tina, Dina, Vampy Debs, Patricia, Amber, Krista, Brenda, Absinthe Alex, Pretty Girl 215, Christy, Kay, Spider's Web, Ulala Andrea, Lady Dracker, Sue, Monique, Sean Gorman, Stacy, Greg, Chelsea, Amanda Jane, Samantha, Zepp, Sarah C, Casey, Linda, Austin, Tegan, Chris and Donna, Erin, Lil Smart, Jenny, Gabrielle, Misanthropia, Ryan, Rudy, Christina De La Rosa, Noosh, Fire 05, Jody, Sarah P, James Gargano, Gemma Allen, Monica Levelace, Alex, and Courtney Maxwell. I will see you on the next one.